Und abwaschen.
잠시 안내 말씀 드리겠습니다. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? We will take a commemorative photo with the VIPs before we begin the forum. The VIPs, please, please, please come up on stage to take the commemorative photo. The speakers and all the panel discussants, please come up on stage. Thank you. Before we officially begin today's event, we're going to have a group photo opportunity. Let me kindly invite all the discussants and speakers of today's event onto the stage. Thank you. May I have your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen? The ninth Global Fiscal Forum will begin shortly. I would like to ask everyone to please come inside and take your seats. Also, to ensure the smooth proceeding of the event, please turn off your mobile phones or switch them to silent mode. Also, please do not forget to wear your mask until the end of the event to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Simultaneous interpretation will be provided for your convenience. Korean is channel number one and English is channel number two. Attention, please. The ninth Global Fiscal Forum will begin shortly. Please make your way into the venue and please be seated. To ensure a smooth event, please turn off your mobile phone or switch it to vibrate or silent mode during the event. Also, please wear a mask until the end of this event to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We also provide simultaneous interpretation for your convenience. Please note that Korea, Korean is on channel one and English is on channel two.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the ninth Global Fiscal Forum. My name is Claudia Lee. It is my great honor and pleasure to be your MC today. Thank you for joining us both online and offline. The ninth Global Fiscal Forum is hosted by the Ministry of Economy and Finance and co-organized by the KDI and OECD. And this year's theme is fiscal policy in the COVID-19 crisis and its role afterwards. As we watched in the video, the Korean government has spared no efforts to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic caused a variety of public health, social and economic challenges in every corner of the world. And in order to overcome such challenges, the government has been providing courageous financial support. Against this backdrop, we'll look at major countries' fiscal policies and share opinions on post-COVID policy directions. Experts from various countries are participating online and offline to share their insights, and domestic and foreign audiences are joining us in real time on YouTube. As we expect today's event to be meaningful and constructive, let's begin the opening ceremony. First and foremost, we'll have opening remarks by Mr. Sang Dae Choi, Deputy Minister for Budget Office at the Ministry of Economy and Finance. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to invite him to the stage and let's give him a big hand. joining us and we have uh, actually uh, have uh, many distinguished guests, uh, distinguished participants uh, here and I also think uh, online. So and we have, we have uh, Dr. Zhang Pyo Hong, uh, President of KDI. And Mr. Yon Blunder, uh, he's not here yet, but then he will join us uh, afterwards. And he is the head of public management and budgeting of OECD. And we also have Mr. Andrew Hero. Yeah, he is from uh, U.S. Embassy. He is a Minister Counselor for Economic Affairs. And we also Mr. Christoph Bass. Are we here? Oh, not yet. <laughs> okay. And also we have uh, also Korean participants. Uh, Dr. Jung Eun Kim, President of Fiscal Policy Institute, and Dr. Won Il Lee, uh, President of Hangyeong uh, National University, and Hyungna, Dr. Hyung Na Oh, uh, she is Professor of Gyeonggi University, and Dr. Tae Seung Lee, Senior Fellow of KDI, and also we have uh, uh, online uh, participants, uh, and I'm not sure. Uh, if they can hear us. Um, Mr. Lonnie Downs, Downs, Assistant Secretary, Department of Public Expenditure and Reform of Ireland. And also Mr. Eric Kla, uh, Head of Fiscal Policy Division, Federal Ministry of Finance uh, in Germany. And lastly, um, Mr. Sean Dougherty, Senior Advisor and Head of Secretariat, OECD Network on Fiscal Regulations. So, and we have many uh, distinguished participants. Uh, I'm very happy and also many thanks for all uh, for joining this uh, today's forum. So, and um, actually it is my great honor um, to make an opening speech today uh, for the ninth uh, Global uh, Fiscal Forum a fiscal policy in the COVID-19 and its role afterwards. 12 years, 12 years have passed since the first forum in 2009, and we have never ceased our journey to share knowledge and experiences on fiscal reform and explore new directions for innovation. Uh, I'm very grateful 
for the experts uh, coming to share the views on how the fiscal policy should work in the present and in the future. Two months ago, two months ago, uh, the 2022 draft budget was submitted for parliamentary approval. The budget for next year aims at full recovery from the crisis in the COVID-19 and structural reform of the Korean economy to prepare for the post-COVID era. The situation in other countries such as the United States and the members of the EU would not be far different from Korea. It brought our challenges not limited to health issues, but also an overall impact on economy and society worldwide. Then, we can't help but wonder how the countries have responded to the threat to health to every individual and how the policies have helped each group. Actually, Korea has overcome the outbreak of the COVID-19 crisis in the initial stage by providing a series of fiscal measures in a comprehensive manner. Not only Korea, but many other countries are, have released a variety of stimulus packages, which would remunerate income loss of those who lost their jobs, and which would recover consumption in the market. The fiscal policy for fiscal year uh, 2020 in Korea could be summarized as four supplementary budgets, as you saw in uh, previous film, and additional customized package for those in need. In fact, such fiscal policy last year, if I remember that, was a historical record in the last 59 years. Based on enough funding from the government, the market could maintain its role as income source for the general public. It is important for every government to remember this historical event as a memorable experience that the future policymakers could refer upon difficulties. A shift in the economic and social paradigm entails another paradigm change in the post-COVID era. Now is the time to formulate fiscal innovation that fits the new era. The condition of government's fiscal reform can be expressed into this single sentence. A fiscal policy in the COVID-19 and afterwards is not merely how much to spend but rather for whom and for what to spend. It is no longer possible to develop good policies solely with efforts to expand the investment to tackle the crisis. Expanding the size of the public expenditure is not enough. Policies should be continuously formulated and upgraded based on innovation for the future. Digital and carbon net zero society are key changers of economy and society. This puts great importance on the role and responsibility of the fiscal authorities that should lead the change. The first key changer is what I now call the policy for the net zero society. The net zero society requires every effort that the fiscal authority can make for each and every sector. For example, it should be concerned about those who need to stop their business and shift to another. Investment in human resources to carry on, on, on the journey to the natural society is another area of investment that the fiscal authorities should have in mind. To support such changes, Korea already proposed a new funding mechanism to support the future agenda, the Climate Response Fund. This fund is the new funding mechanism to prepare expected costs 
support transfer to the natural society. In the meantime, the other key changer for the future is the digital formation in every sector. Personally, and frankly, I have long thought digitalization is an issue limited to unsophisticated technology. However, the recent change proves that it is not something for the special, but rather a normal lifestyle that everybody should be accustomed to. As a result, more investment in digitalization for every in individual should be another priority that the fiscal authorities should make sure to happen in real. Such a priorities assure us of a possibility that the fiscal policy can function as a key player to recover from the crisis and provide new opportunities for the future. Now, not only Korea but also many other countries are in the process of preparing a new fiscal measure to prepare for the future. I hope this forum will be open new to discuss not only the measures that we have taken for the past and present, but also for the future. Today, as I said before, uh, we have several uh, respected speakers attending from the embassies in Korea and institutions for fiscal policies. Fiscal policy from the United States and Ireland, uh, I expect to highlight the importance of extended fiscal policy upon COVID-19. In addition, the future agenda from the EU and Germany show how each region and country are responding to emerging issues in preparation for the future. I believe that the presentation today will give us an opportunity to look at the fiscal measures that we have already taken, as well as those that we are coming up with. And I also hope that this forum could provide each speaker with opportunities to share their views and experiences in these important issues. I wish that you all could enjoy today's forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister Choi. It's not about how much we spend, but rather for who and for what. Yes, thank you once again for opening today's event with such insightful words. And yes, it is true, today's event is a symbol for unceasing passion to share knowledge and experts with a global um, audience. So next, we're going to have welcoming remarks, and Mr. Zhang Pyo Hong, president of the Korea Development Institute, will deliver a speech. Ladies and gentlemen, let's invite him with a big round of applause. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. I am the president of KDI, Hong Jang Pyo. I would first like to thank all of the distinguished guests, speakers, and discussants uh, participating in this forum despite your busy schedules. On behalf of KDI, the co-organizer of the ninth global fiscal forum. In addition, amidst the challenges of the COVID. 19 pandemic, which has not been fully overcome. This fiscal forum it was prepared and hosted by the Ministry of Economy and Finance. I would like to thank Deputy Minister Che Sang Dae of MOEF, and also I would like to thank uh, Yong Blonder, Head of Budgeting and Public Management Division of OECD, for your support. As you know, in responding to the COVID-19 crisis, we were able to th rethink about the fiscal role of our government. Amidst an unprecedented crisis, our government, as a last resort for the people in terms of receiving assistance, did not hesitate in providing bold and swift support to the people. 
financial resources which have been carefully managed has been actively injected into our society without any hesitation to alleviate and cushion the shock of the crisis and to seek for new opportunities for a way forward. Also now with increased vaccination and development of treatments, it is time to find ways to return to normal by transitioning our infectious disease management system to one gear toward a time of living with the coronavirus. And so, we will have to help those who are most vulnerable in our society and prepare for the conditions for overcoming this crisis situation. So that would be another role of the government. The KDI, along with the Ministry of Economy, Finance, and the OECD, has prepared the ninth Global Fiscal Forum on the topic of fiscal policy and the COVID-19 crisis and its role afterwards. Today, there will be discussions by fiscal experts and members of the international organizations from home and abroad on the direction for fiscal investments in a post-COVID-19 era and look into fiscal management strategies. In order to overcome the COVID-19 crisis, a proactive role is essential in terms of financial policy. The global economy is showing signs of recovery, but for its full recovery and advancement to the next stage, we still have a long way to go. It is difficult to transition hastily to a type of policy before economic uncertainties driven by the pandemic has been dissolved. On the other hand, we cannot continue to issue government bonds and increase national debt endlessly. As such, in order to wisely manage fiscal operations, we need to look into the fiscal strategies of other nations and find a way forward. In addition, with many OECD nations presenting carbon neutrality as their new policy goals, relevant discussions are fastly taking place in the international area. The Republic of Korea, too, is making various policy efforts to achieve the goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. To respond to these new changes, we must discuss what the role of government fiscal policies are during the discussions of this forum, I look forward to Korea and other nations finding the right direction for their respective fiscal policies. I extend a warm welcome and thanks to the experts and researchers joining us online and offline. My gratitude once again goes to the Ministry of Economy and Finance and the OECD for their efforts in preparing for this event from the very early stages. And I would also like to thank our KDI staff for working hard to put this event together uh, during a short period of time. Thank you for your vast interest and support for KDI. Uh, he gave a very accurate diagnosis of the present status. Yes, indeed, the fiscal policies are the re last result, resort and the safety net and the way to lead forward as a nation. Thank you once again, Mr. President. And this brings us to the conclusion of the opening ceremony. Um, we are going to begin the first session of the forum, and the first session is titled Fiscal Policy Responses to COVID-19. The first speaker is uh, Pyong Jun Kang, Director of Budget Management Division at the Ministry of Economy and Finance. He'll deliver a presentation on Korea's fiscal responses to COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a big hand. Good afternoon. As have been introduced, I am Pyeongjung Kang, Director of Budget Management Division at 
M-O-E-F. I would like to take this opportunity to talk about the recovery for all Korea's fiscal response to COVID-19. I would like to start with the background, then talk about Korea's response, take a look at the supplementary budget for 2020 lessons learned and conclusion. In January of 2020, we had the first case of COVID-19. In the following month, we had 3,736 infected with 18 deaths. If we compare this to the 2015 MERS incident, during MERS, 186 were infected in one and a half months with 38 deaths. So we had more people infected and less deaths. With the spread of COVID-19, we had the risk of depression in Korea. If we take a look at CSI, in January of 2020, the index was at 104.2, which fell to 96.9 in February of 2020, which is the largest decline since MERS. If we take a look at the BSI index, we can see that the figures fell from 76 to 65 during the same period, which is the sharpest fall since July of 2012. So many people believed in the risk of depression at that time. COVID-19 was a shock that the Korean economy had never experienced before. In response to COVID-19, the Korean government made efforts to recover quickly, and we also created supplementary budgets for the post-COVID-19 era. In March of 2020, we had the first supplementary budget, followed by three more until September of 2020. And in December of 2020, we also created a customized relief package. In 2021 this year, we had two supplementary budgets. In this chapter, I would like to take a look at Korea's response to COVID-19 prevention and control. If we take a look at the Korean government's response, it was on four fronts. First is the supply of masks. Second is a strategy called 4T plus alpha. Third is the utilization of ICT to have efficient prevention of disease. And third, fourth is vaccination. Concerning the supply of masks, during the early stages of the pandemic, there was a heightened demand for masks, and so the price for masks continued to increase exponentially, which became a burden on households. And so the government tried to stabilize the market by increasing production. We eased regulations on the facilities, and we also conducted a five-day rotation system for mask distribution until June of 2020. Second is the 4T plus alpha strategy. Under the strategy, we focused on screening, transparent communication, and disease control. We also conducted national briefings twice a day in order to communicate with the people to build trust. Third, we responded to COVID-19 using ICT, for example, establishing the Self-Quarantine Safety Protection app and also establishing drive-through testing centers. We also made efforts to secure sufficient vaccines. From 2020 to 2021, we have been able to vaccinate 56 million individuals, and we also allocated 5.8 trillion won for vaccine and disease prevention and control. As of October 2021, more than 70% of individuals are now fully vaccinated. In this chapter, I would like to cover Korea's supplementary budget for the fiscal year 2020. Before I go into the actual supplementary budget, I would like to take a look at some preventive, preemptive measures that we undertook. 
In January of 2020, ever since the first outbreak of COVID-19, we have done our utmost and we actually provided a 4 trillion won package to those who have been hard hit by COVID-19. This includes disease control systems, treatment of those who have been in quarantine, who have been confirmed, working with mask supply, and also working on financial and tax benefits for those who have been influenced by COVID-19. And in the end of February of 2020, we decided on creating a 16 trillion won worth package to revive the economy. The package plan actually included various policies to support small merchants and also low-income households. Despite the efforts made by the Korean government, COVID-19 continued to spread throughout the country and it actually put a downward pressure on the economy. And so in order to overcome COVID-19 and to mitigate the impact on the Korean economy, we decided on a supplementary budget. In March of 2020, the National Assembly approved a 11.7 trillion won supplementary budget. This would include prioritizing disease control and minimizing impact on small businesses. This included the support for those who were confirmed and the businesses that were impacted. And in supporting the small size businesses, we actually included 2.4 trillion won in this budget. This actually included reducing rent, providing support for traditional markets, and also providing tax benefits and support for bank financial interests. We also provided gift certificates to low-income families, and we also provided supplementations for the employing the youth. And 0 0.8 trillion won was invested for the local economy. Depending on the situation of the local areas, special support was provided. And we also enlarged the issuance of local gift certificates to tr 3 trillion won. The second supplementary budget in April 2020 was approved by the National Assembly against the backdrop of the understanding that this was a depression that was on par with the Great Depression of the 30s. And that was a situation when we experienced a decrease in the real economy. And so in order to support all families in Korea, we actually provided a universal payment for 22.7 million households for up to 1 million won per family. In July of 2020, the third supplementary budget was approved and the total volume was 35.3 trillion won. First, it included revenue adjustment due to COVID-19, that was 11.4 trillion won. Second, we included financial support to protect jobs and businesses, in particular for micro businesses, SMEs, and mid-sized businesses. And we also provided emergency cash flow support for key industries and enterprises for a total value of 5 trillion won. Third, we also invested 9.4 trillion won for social protection, and we invested 11.3 trillion won for a stimulus package. At that time, the economy started to recover, and in the third and fourth quarter of 2020, ex we expected a economic recovery. 
But as COVID-19 continued to spread, that had a downward pressure on the domestic economy, which impacted those who were vulnerable in terms of employment and child care, as well as small merchants and low-income households. And that is why we approved the fourth supplementary budget worth 7.8 trillion won in September of 2020. This supplementary budget included support for small merchants and SMEs worth 3.9 trillion won. And for companies that were impacted because of social distancing, we also provided additional allowances as well as credit. For those who were at risk of unemployment, 1.5 trillion won was provided to provide as subsidies. For those who were freelancers, we provided emergency support, and we also provided support for those who could work in emergency areas. So 240,000 jobs were provided for emergency workers. And for those whose income was reduced amongst low-income households due to COVID-19, a total of 0 0.4 trillion won was provided in emergency livelihood support. And for those who were eligible to work, we worked on job matching. Last but not least, because there were extensive closure of schools, we provided emergency child care support worth 1.8 trillion won in total. And for elementary school students and below, we provided extra child care subsidiaries. And we also provided support for middle and high school students so that they can receive support for online classes. In December of 2020, the number of COVID-19 confirmed cases spiked, and we continue to strengthen social distancing measures. But we also experienced that because of this, the economy turned for the worst, and there was a big impact on the micro businesses. And so we came up with a special customized package. The total volume was 9.3 trillion won, and it included emergency relief, disease control and prevention, and customized relief packages for small merchants, SMEs, the unemployed, and for those who were at a high risk for the need of emergency child care. Well, for emergency relief, we provided 5.1 trillion won as support for small merchants and 0 0.5 trillion won as income support for vulnerable employees. We also provided 0 0.4 trillion won for public health infrastructure for infectious diseases and 0 0.1 trillion won for remuneration of health service institutions. And for small merchants and SMEs who are impacted heavily by COVID-19, we provided a customized relief package worth 2.9 trillion won in total, which included the support for reopening small businesses, emergency employment, as well as safety net for vulnerable groups such as the youth and the elderly. We also provided support for freelancers. For the safety net for vulnerable groups, we is expanded safety through 0 0.1 trillion won, and we supported 0 0.2 trillion won for emergency child care. Up until now, we took a look at Korea's response to COVID-19. Now, let us take a look at New Deal, which prepares for the post-COVID-19 era. In July of 2020, the Korean government announced the New Deal in order to strive for a transformation in the post-COVID-19 era. 
We went through a full year of investments and improvement of institutions, and so we decided our priorities of online education as well as eco-friendly economy. The international politics and economics continued to change rapidly during this time, and we needed a new response to these new trends. The Korean government decided on a 33.7 trillion won New Deal 2.0. in order to respond to the changing trends surrounding the Korean Peninsula. First, the Digital New Deal is worth 9.3 trillion won to create ICT transformation and convergence. We also wish to support blockchains and other technologies that would be essential for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The Green New Deal is worth 13.3 trillion won in order to transform into a net zero society. We would be supporting the transformation to renewable energy and to support the expansion of eco-friendly vehicles. This would also include the support for technological transformation of carbon intensive industries. Human New Deal is worth 11.1 .1 trillion won and it is an investment into human resources. Especially for the youth, we would be providing asset, housing, and education support. And we will also be providing employment benefits to the youth. Furthermore, in order to respond to inequality expected in post-COVID-19, we will also strengthen our safety net through the Human New Deal. Now let's take a look at some policy implications. The first policy implication is decision-making by the leadership and communicating transparently with the public is very important. Second, in order to respond to the shock of the pandemic, we need to design a comprehensive and phased economic response package. Third, even if we have a perfect policy, if the timing is not adequate, it could not be effective. For Korea, in the process of overcoming COVID-19, we provided timely and sufficient support for the vulnerable groups, which was essential. Fourth, in responding to crises, we need to prepare for social and economic changes whether it be COVID-19 or Fourth Industrial Revolution, we will experience changes in our society. And during those changes, we need to take into consideration the vulnerable groups in order to strive for a stable future. Fifth, in the crisis that is being prolonged, we need to find the right balance between disease control and economic stability. In the case of Korea, Without having a full shutdown, we were able to stably manage COVID-19 and the subsequent crises. Let me now go to my conclusion. In the process of overcoming COVID-19, Korea approved four supplementary budgets, and we have been able to actively respond to COVID-19 and we have also been able to prepare for the future. And as a result, compared to other major countries, we were able to experience the fastest recovery. Amongst the advanced countries, in the first quarter of 2021, Korea was the only country to recover the highest the the GDP levels of the pre-pandemic period. And in the second quarter of 2021, we have maintained the highest level of recovery amongst the major nations. In Korea, we have supported small merchants and those who were vulnerable in terms of employment 
to have a well-planned safety net for the vulnerable groups in our society. The shock of COVID-19 is usually concentrated in the vulnerable groups, but because of our policies, the household income continuously increased and the redistribution effect of government policies expanded significantly. The policies of Korea in responding to COVID-19 will become an important example for future infectious diseases. Last but not least, we live in a hyper-connected society and infectious diseases know no border. And so organic cooperation across the globe is needed for a fast recovery. This is something that Korea and countries around the world have experienced in overcoming COVID-19. And that is why we need to share the results of our policies for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Director Kang. Uh, we were able to learn comprehensive and thorough uh, measures taken by the Korean government and their wonderful results as well uh, to support the, those in need in Korea during the crisis. Next, we're going to have the second presentation by Mr. Andrew Harrop, Minister Counselor for Economic Affairs, U.S. Embassy, Seoul. He'll brief us on the U.S. fiscal policy to fight COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a big hand. Annyeonghaseyo and good afternoon. Uh, it is my honor to join you today at the ninth Global Fiscal Forum. I want to begin by thanking the uh, Deputy Minister uh, Chae Sung Day and the Ministry of Econo Economy and Finance for inviting me to speak here. I would also like to thank the Korea Development Institute and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, for their role in organizing this forum and for providing a platform for governments to coordinate efforts to overcome this unprecedented public health and economic crisis. I'd also like to congratulate the Republic of Korea for its successful efforts to contain the pandemic and to cushion its impact on the economy. As uh, the Deputy Minister, uh, Director Kang, and the opening video demonstrated, uh, this was a detailed and people-focused economic response that I think bears a fair amount of similarities to that from the United States. Korea's fast adoption of technology to manage the pandemic has served as a global model. Its vaccine distribution rates, over 70% fully vaccinated already, are also truly remarkable. Furthermore, the Republic of Korea and the United States have deepened our cooperation throughout the pandemic. As key partners, we both aim to build our economies back better and with greater resiliency. The United States heavily relied on fiscal policy to combat the pandemic and mitigate its impact on the environment. See, I have a fairly minimalist approach to slides today. This will be the only one. Um, for my presentation today, um, I would like to walk you through two of America's major fiscal measures in response to the pandemic, uh, the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan, the ARP. I'll also review uh, some of their outcomes to date. And in the latter part of my presentation, I'll also discuss remaining fiscal policies in the pipeline as we endeavor to return to normality. The U.S. government aggressively implemented several policies to address the economic hardships posed by the pandemic. In the early stages of the pandemic, the U.S. introduced one of the largest fiscal st stimulus packages as a share of gross domestic product. Through July 2020, U.S. fiscal spending was 50% larger than in the United Kingdom and roughly three times that of France, Italy, or Spain. The most recent tally by the International Monetary Fund shows the U.S. leading by far in the scale of its fiscal response to the pandemic since January 2020. To date, the United States has spent the equivalent of 25.5% of its annual GDP in fiscal response measures uh, to the pandemic and nearly 28% of its GDP when also including liquidity support measures that have rolled out, been rolled out in the form of loans, asset purchases, or debt assumptions. 
looking at the fiscal stimulus alone, the U.S. has injected the biggest stimulus package among advanced economies, the CARES Act. The U.S. government's first major fiscal response to the, academic, uh, to the pandemic came with the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, CARES Act, um, which was signed into law on March 27, 2020. The CARES Act authorized $2.7 trillion in government spending to provide immediate relief to households. Funding under the CARES Act provided immediate direct financial assistance to economically vulnerable individuals delivered in the form of Economic Impact Payments, or EIPs. It also increased unemployment compensation and provided full federal financing for extended benefits, including the self-employed and gig workers, uh, one of the many areas, I think, where you will see a similarity between the United States approach and that of the Republic of Korea. Finally, the Act helped postpone tax payments and delay loan payment for federal-backed student loans. To assist small businesses hit by the pandemic retain their workforce, the CARES Act included the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, signed into law in April of 2020. The Small Business Administration, uh, with support from the Department of Treasury, implemented the PPP, which authorized up to $659 billion for job retention in small businesses. Under the PPP, the government provided funds for small businesses to maintain payrolls and covered overhead costs for hiring back laid off employees. Businesses were also allowed to use the PPP to cover interest on mortgages, rent, and utilities. The CARES Act was later modified through the COVID-related Tax Relief Act of 2020, one of the many tax policy changes aimed at alleviating the individual economic hardships. The Act extended several provisions in the CARES Act, including those linked to direct payments for individuals, unemployment insurance benefits, and child tax credits. The second major set of initiatives fell under the American Rescue Plan Act, ARP, signed by President Biden on March 11th of this year. The most comprehensive strategy, uh, U.S. government strategy to date, uh, to battle the pandemic-induced economic crisis, the program manages over $1 trillion in fiscal spending that provides support on three fronts, household and families, businesses, and state and local governments. On the first front, uh, families in the United States directly received over $450 billion under the ARP. The funds have been rolled out in the form of $170, billion, or $170 million EIP payments, these are economic impact payments, to individuals that total over $400 billion. Child tax credit payments to families uh, totaling $46 billion. Adjusted tax returns and tax refunds on the first $10,000 of unemployment insurance benefits and emergency rental assistance programs for low-income households to avoid evictions. We are already seeing positive changes since the ARP's rollout. Data from the Census Bureau Household Pulse Survey have shown a 24% drop in food insecurity among families with children. The Treasury projects uh, that families of more than 26 million children who previously received no child tax credit are now eligible for the program. Pivoting to support for businesses, the American Rescue Plan aimed to provide immediate assistance and investment for long-term growth. At its core, it was designed to help businesses hardest hit by the pandemic by keeping employees on the payroll. Among its numerous programs to prevent pandemic-induced workforce turnover, the Employee Retention Tax Credit Program provided up to $28,000 per employee for small businesses which experienced a decline in revenues or a shutdown. Programs like this are operated in tandem with other programs that exist outside the Rescue Plan's umbrella. I'd like to bring your attention to a few that have targeted support for critical industries like transportation, airlines, and restaurants. The Coronavirus Economic Relief for Transportation Services Program is estimated to have supported over 500,000 airline workers and 262,000 workers in other transportation businesses since the onset of COVID. The program has dispersed nearly $2 billion in grants, over 1,400 hard-hit transportation businesses vital to the economic health of their communities. About 90% of the grants are estimated to have reached small and family-owned businesses, excluded some from some of the larger pandemic relief programs. 
The Restaurant Revitalization Fund is another example of a program that targeted one of the most vulnerable sectors of the American economy during the pandemic. The program, which is now closed, is uh, provided restaurants and bars up to $10 million per, per business for revenue loss caused by the pandemic. The third and last pillar of the rescue plan focused on keeping state and local governments afloat. Under this pillar of the rescue plan, the Treasury has sent over $240 billion to, to support state, territorial, local, and tribal governments to accelerate local economic recovery and keep the pandemic spread in check. Over 99% of these state and local fiscal recovery funds are now in the hands of local governments across the United States. These funds offer flexibility to states and local governments to address their specific economic recovery challenges. Harris County in Texas, for example, has used the fund to boost vaccination rates uh, among young people and members of the black and Latino communities by providing $100 incentives for people who receive their first vaccine dose. Washington, D.C., uh, where I uh, have a house, um, has earmarked $350 million to make investments in the production and preservation of affordable housing to address both urgent and long-standing long housing needs of its residents. In Kentucky, uh, the local government is planning to devote $250 million to water and sewer infrastructure projects. The investment aims to deliver safe and reliable water to people across the state, while also creating more than 3,800 direct and indirect jobs. In addition to aiding households and businesses, the U.S. government has also used fiscal tools to stable financial markets. Relatively early in the pandemic, the Federal Open Markets Committee lowered the federal funds target rate to 0% from one quarter of a percent and also implemented large-scale purchases of Treasury securities and agency mortgage-backed securities. The FOMC also established numerous emergency lending facilities using its authority under Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act and by leveraging capital provided by the Treasury. These efforts reassured nervous financial markets and prevented the unprecedented public health crisis from ballooning into a full-on financial crisis. Now, before I wrap up my presentation, I'd like to speak about what remains in the pipeline for the U.S. economy on our road to recovery. Moving forward, the U.S. government intends to use the rescue plan and other existing programs introduced during the pandemic to begin responding to longer-term challenges for the economy. Programs such as the Child Tax Credit, Emergency Rental Assistance Program, and the Homeowner Assistance Fund will continue to put billions of dollars into the hands of low-income families still struggling, to, still struggling to recover from the pandemic's economic impact. Other funds in the pipeline include a $9 billion Homeowners Assistance Fund to help own homeowners struggling with mortgage payments. Additional support for states and local governments is also on the way through the $10 billion Capital Projects Fund designed to support communities by enabling work, education, and health monitoring. While much work needs to be done, U.S. policymakers are now looking beyond addressing short-term needs of the economy to ensure the U.S. builds back better out of the pandemic. In closing, let me thank you again for the opportunity to speak at this event. As the battle against uh, COVID-19 continues, governments must come together to share their lessons learned of navigating through the pandemic and discuss ways to build back better from the global crisis. I look forward to the upcoming discussions from other distinguished experts today. Kamsahamnida. Thank you very much for your detailed explanation on the two major measures by the American government, the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan. And it feels great to hear that the stimulus packages of both countries were timely and effective. Thank you once again. Now we have one last presentation for session one, and the third presenter is Ronnie Downs, Assistant Secretary at the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform in Ireland. He'll deliver a presentation on Ireland's fiscal policy response to COVID-19, 
balancing social support with sustainability. Now let's connect to him uh, virtually. Hello, Assistant Secretary Downs. Hello. Uh, Hi. Nice to see you. Just, you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you very well. Please continue with your presentation. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure uh, and an honor to join you here from, uh, from Dublin uh, uh, to share our experience of the uh, fiscal response to uh, dealing with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Let me start by uh, thanking uh, colleagues in the KDI, in the Ministry of Economy and Finance, and in the OECD for organizing this uh, important event and for inviting me to share some experiences from, uh, from this part of the world. And I must say at the start that uh, I'm struck by the similarities and the parallels between the different approaches that are taken, whether in uh, South Korea, in uh, America, in uh, other parts of the world, I think there has been a, a huge response by policymakers and politicians to uh, really rise up to the challenge, the enormous challenge of uh, protecting our people, protecting our businesses, uh, while also keeping an eye on the very important job for ministries of finance of making sure that uh, in giving these supports, we keep our economies and uh, our public finances on track so I guess that will be a theme of uh, my presentation, just uh, how we have supported people, supported businesses, and how we have tried to balance this with um, what for Ireland is a very important uh, goal of keeping our fiscal policy on track, uh, keeping it sustainable into the future. So um, I'd be grateful if you could move on to the first slide, please. So just by way of context, uh, if we look back and uh, we hear that th it's uh, 12 years since the first uh, fiscal forum back in 2009, well, it's 12 or maybe 13 years since uh, the global financial crisis. And that is still very alive in our memories uh, in Ireland because uh, we were one of the countries that was most heavily affected in uh, fiscal and economic terms. Uh, and, and so that places an important context on our fiscal policy response to COVID-19 as well. Just uh, to recap, uh, to remind ourselves of the situation that Ireland faced back uh, a decade ago, uh, during the, the global financial crisis, uh, our fiscal deficit uh, plunged to more than 30% of, uh, of, of GDP in in 2010, and we have had a, a very hard and difficult road to correct our public finances uh, with the support of, uh, of, of IMF and uh, European Union um, colleagues. Uh, and so our, our story for the past decade, for the last 10 years, has been one of strong recovery, strong rebuilding of our public finances and rebuilding credibility uh, in our public finances. And you'll see from the... Uh, the horizontal bars on this graph, uh, it just shows snapshots of five-year intervals of where our public finances were. Uh, our, that's our current and our capital expenditure growth. So you'll see from the period from 1999 to 2004, this was a strong boom period uh, in Ireland, sometimes called the Celtic Tiger period. And over that five-year period, our current expenditure grew by 80%. Uh, we tried to re try to rein things in a bit, try to contain things uh, to over the, the subsequent five-year period, just coming up to the, 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 the financial crisis. Uh, and then during those years of crisis, uh, you'll see uh, our current expenditure actually contracted by 9%. And it's quite noticeable, the, the lighter colored bar chart, our capital expenditure uh, was really affected. That was really cut back. Uh, so our longer term investment and infrastructure plans took a hit. Um, but since that period, uh, there has been a rebound in both the current and especially the capital side, and I'll return to that uh, a little bit later. So that's the context uh, with it, which is very fresh in our minds as we, as we faced into the, 
the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, also during this period, during this past decade, uh, we placed a lot of focus on budgetary reform and uh, really upgrading and improving uh, the way in which we do uh, our budgets uh, and what it is we try to achieve. Now, this is a very busy slide. I'm not going to go through it in, in detail. But uh, in essence, uh, you'll see from the, the outer ring, uh, this concerns engagement, much stronger levels and deeper levels of engagement with, with stakeholders in society and parliamentary stakeholders uh, and with citizens more generally uh, as, as a hallmark of how we do policy uh, in, in, into the future. And uh, in, towards the centre, there are some other important themes of, uh, of budgetary reform, including a focus on performance, including a focus on uh, equality, including gender equality. Um, we've heard also about the importance of uh, carbon budgeting and climate budgeting, and that's a big focus for Ireland now and into the future. And uh, these are becoming crystallized into what we call uh, our well-being budgeting framework. And uh, perhaps this will be uh, an important topic that we can return to in more detail in, uh, in session two. Uh, but for now, if we move on to the next slide, please. We've heard... Um, uh, certainly, we've heard uh, America uh, has led the world in terms of the scale and significance of the uh, the fiscal response uh, to the pandemic. Um, Ireland, uh, if you measure as a percentage of uh, uh, gross national income, Ireland uh, has also had a, a proportionately very large uh, uh, increase in supports uh, in response uh, to the pandemic. I think our government, um, so this, this did take a little bit of decision from our politicians because, as I say, uh, we have been rebuilding our uh, fiscal credibility or fiscal sustainability. But nevertheless, when the COVID crisis struck, uh, the government took a decision uh, to really use that uh, fiscal comfort blanket and uh, protect citizens and protect businesses and not uh, that this was not a time for um, this is not a time for uh, being overly cautious, uh, not a time for fiscal prudence. This is a time for using the fiscal power that, of the state uh, to to protect people. So a very large scale of investment, and I'll go into some more details about how they were used uh, over the next few slides. So the next slide, please. Um, of course, the impact on the fiscal deficit has been uh, has been enormous. Uh, Ireland has used all of the tools at our disposal, uh, whether that's direct public expenditure, uh, taxation measures, uh, loan guarantees for small businesses uh, to cushion the impact and to protect people uh, during the pandemic. So, uh, I'm showing there about twelve billion. Uh, of 12 billion euro of expenditure last year. Another uh, deficit of 12 billion uh, is in prospect uh, this year, 2021. And uh, even with economic recovery, uh, our Ireland is going to run another very large deficit in 2022. Um, but I'll say some words a little bit later about the medium term framework that we're developing uh, to chart a pathway back to uh, economic sustainability. Next slide, please. Um, I think a key element of Ireland's fiscal response uh, has been distinguishing between what we call core and non-core expenditure. Uh, our focus really over the last decade has been on building, con or allowing for uh, public expenditure to grow at uh, a steady, sustainable, uh, manageable rate uh, over the medium term and into the future. So how do we marry that with, uh, how do we reconcile that with the huge extra supports needed for, for COVID? Well, what we, what we have done is uh, we have drawn a very clear distinction between our underlying core expenditure and our non-core uh, expenditure, our so exceptional supports are the ones which are outside of our fiscal framework. 
Um, I think Ireland had a little bit of a, a head start on this because uh, before the pandemic struck, uh, we had to deal with the Brexit, uh, the exit of the United Kingdom from the European Union uh, was, as you recall, big news um, a couple of years ago before the pandemic. Uh, and Ireland as a you know, very close, uh, the closest neighbour to uh, the United Kingdom with very close trade and other links with the UK was uh, very nervous about the impact of Brexit. So we had been preparing in 2018, 2019 for this, making room for exceptional supports uh, that might be needed to deal with the impact of Brexit. So that's when we developed this notion of core and non-core expenditure. Uh, and uh, as it turned out, uh, some of the contingent allocations, the, the reserves that we had put in place to deal with uh, to deal with Brexit, we were able to redirect those to deal with uh, the impact of the pandemic when it struck in uh, in 2020. Um, we're keeping this concept of core, non-core expenditure. It's built right into our fiscal projections into the future because in our mind, it shows it allows for transparency, um, and public transparency and international transparency on the scale of our fiscal supports uh, while locking in this concept of uh, medium-term sustainability into the future for our core underlying permanent expenditure. Next slide, please. Um, this slide just shows, and uh, perhaps I'll say a few words about uh, the, uh, the, the types of exceptional expenditure that we have engaged in in Ireland. Uh, as I say, I'm very struck by the similarities and the close parallels between the type of measures that have been adopted in, uh, in Ireland and, and the type of measures we've heard about in uh, South Korea and in other countries. Um, so we focused on uh, social transfers to citizens. So we introduced something called the pandemic unemployment payment. So, so many people, because we had a, a very hard lockdown in, uh, in 2022, um, so, so many people were uh, out of work that we introduced a, uh, an exceptional pandemic unemployment payment, PUP, um, and, uh, and employer subsidies as well, uh, the employer wage subsidy scheme uh, to foster a close link between uh, businesses and employees, uh, as well as then providing subsidies to key public, uh, key, uh, public services such as uh, education, uh, transport, and other sectors. Um, of course, uh, particularly during quarter uh, one, quarter two of 2020, a lot of expenditure on uh, PPE, personal protective uh, equipment, uh, gowns and face masks and so on for our, our health service, but also these, uh, these supports for citizens uh, and supports for businesses. Uh, and indeed, um, one of the notable features in Ireland uh, was uh, the range of exceptional supports for our arts and culture industry, uh, with so many people, of course, confined to home um, under lockdown. Uh, we did place an extra premium, an extra emphasis on allowing access, virtual access to uh, artistic and cultural events. Uh, also to keep the to keep the cultural sector going as well, uh, because they didn't have so many people coming to their events. Um, but you can see from the slide that uh, this this slide shows the change in year on year expenditure in general government expenditure. So they're really uh, enormous swings uh, uh, relative to the relative to the, the pre pandemic position. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I, I think. Uh, this graph shows uh, the, the the swing in uh, the number of people who are on uh, who are basically unemployed or who are supported with the exceptional uh, pandemic unemployment payment, which is paid directly to individuals, uh, and the employment wage subsidy scheme, which was paid to employers. Uh, the focus here was, um, and you can see the swing from the hard, initial hard lockdown in. Uh, 
spring of 2020 and how our labour market has fluctuated right up till uh, September uh, last month. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so we have placed a, a focus on maintaining that link between employers and uh, employees. And uh, that has proven to be uh, successful as we move towards uh, an exit phase. So the, the next slide, please. Yeah, so, so um, the, the latest uh, data that is available to us uh, is confirming that um, as the economy begins to recover now, that is met with a strong employment response. So the, the jobs market is recovering and the connection that we have invested in between employers and employees is uh, leading to a, a rapid and healthy rebound and recovery in our in our jobs uh, market. So uh, the employment increase in the second quarter uh, of this year is uh, shows an increase in our, our labor force, our people in employment of over 15% relative to the, the first quarter as we begin to relax the restrictions in society, start to open up society again. And uh, so now um, we're, we're back our employment numbers are uh, total job postings are back uh, at and uh, uh, above their pre-pandemic levels. So Ireland is seeing a very strong economic rebound and a very strong jobs uh, rebound, which is uh, which is very positive and very heartening to see. Next slide, please. Um, a couple of themes for where we go into the future. Uh, I mentioned at the start that uh, during the last crisis a decade ago, um, our capital investment took a very strong uh, cutback. Uh, so that really had implications for investment in infrastructure, investment in regional growth around all parts of the country. Um, the government uh, and we in public administration have taken a decision to do things very differently uh, this time around. Uh, so there's a strong um, increased allocation towards capital investment uh, into the future. So a few weeks ago, we published our national development plan, a revised national development plan, uh, which sets out our expenditure ceilings and our expenditure strategy, our capital expenditure strategy for the next uh, decade. And in that national development plan, Ireland has taken a decision to uh, effectively double the level of capital investment to about 5% of, uh, of gross national income um, over, the, uh, over the decade ahead. Uh, so that in itself sends a strong signal to industry and to investors that uh, you know, Ireland is going to maintain uh, a continuous and an increasing uh, level of investment in, uh, in infrastructure and in uh, in vital services. Next slide, please. And with regard to the um, the role of fiscal rules, uh, I think it's important uh, to, to, to give a sense, uh, and the government certainly feels it's important to give a sense of how we're going to you know, regain, recover uh, sustainability of our public finances into the future or guarantee them into the future. Um, as uh, you may know, uh, Ireland, of course, as a part of the European Union, we're subject to uh, fiscal rules, a range of fiscal rules, the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, I'm sure you may be familiar with. Uh, but that, uh, those fiscal rules have an escape clause in times of emergency, and that general escape clause was activated uh, in 2020 in response to the pandemic, and it will remain in place for the next couple of years. Um, and those rules... In, that EU economic governance framework, those fiscal rules framework, uh, they're going to be reviewed at the moment as well to see how fit for purpose they are. Um, but that still means that Ireland uh, as a, a nation state on its own um, has to give a signal to our citizens and to international uh, partners as to how we're going to guarantee sustainability. So uh, we have mapped out, the government has mapped out recently a medium-term fiscal strategy, uh, which is going to maintain 
expenditure growth, overall expenditure is going to be maintained in line with, um, in line with uh, overall uh, economic growth over the medium term, uh, and we're, we're moving rapidly towards a, a balanced budget position. So the, the graph just shows that on our latest projections, we're going to stabilize uh, our core, our underlying expenditure, uh, as a percentage of gross national income uh, into the future. Um, uh, just uh, earlier this month, uh, we had our national budget and uh, our core uh, spending, core public expenditure increased by just over 5% in line with economic growth. Um, that's, that's our core underlying expenditure, so the, the exceptional expenditure was on top of that. And uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, our economy more generally is uh, as is recovering and is recovering even more strongly than we had anticipated and uh, I think that reflects the, the policies of government and the role of society in uh, supporting our businesses, supporting our citizens and we, I suppose, emphasising that trust, building that trust between government and citizens that the government is here to protect people and to protect our economy and our society into the, into the longer term. I think that has been one of the lessons of the COVID-19 experience for Ireland, the importance of using fiscal policy as a tool, not just as an economic tool, but as a, as a, a social support uh, mechanism as well uh, to protect our citizens, to protect our businesses. Um, maybe I shall pause there and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to engaging in discussion as the afternoon progresses. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, your explanation on non versus a uh, core versus non-core expenditure was very intriguing, and also specific market-based approaches were shared. And it's uh, great to hear that they worked uh, really uh, effectively. Uh, during the first presentation. And in the last presentation, we heard about core and non-core expenditures. Even though the three countries um, named these special stimulus packages in a different way, I think the intent and the purpose of those fiscal support are well aligned and have many uh, different, uh, many commonalities. And congratulations on the strong results um, that were driven by effective uh, engagement. And also, thank you for the hard work uh, to build back our society and countries to uh, better ones. Um, as you can see, the table is being arranged for our next segment of the show. And while the setting is done, let me introduce the speakers and the participants. We'll have uh, three speakers, Director Pyong Jung Kang and Assistant Secretary Ronnie Downs, as well as Hangyong National University President Won Hee Lee, KDI Fellow Tessa Lee, and Senior Advisor and Head of Secretariat for the OECD Network on Fiscal Relations, Sean M. Duggerty, who will join us as a panelist. The session will be moderated by Fiscal Policy Institute President, uh, Mr. Jung Hoon uh, Kim. I hope that the panel discussion will be another a really wonderful opportunity to hear about experts on knowledge and suggestions for our future that are for sure going to be bright. Um, without uh, further ado, um, let me invite our moderator, speakers, and discussants uh, to the stage. Mr. Pyongjung Kang and uh, Mr. Ronnie Downs will join us uh, virtually, and we have uh, Mr. Wanhee Lee, Mr. Tessak Lee, Mr. Sean Dougherty will also join us virtually, and we will have, last but not least, invite Mr. Jong Hun Kim to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, let's usher them in with a big hand.
Yes, I see that one seat is empty at the moment. We have uh, Mr. Pyong Jung Kang and we have Mr. Tazak Lee. Oh, sorry, Mr. Kang. So even though it seemed that the chairs were four, actually on-site participants are three, and the other two are going to join online virtually. Okay, so without further ado, let's begin the panel discussion. Sorry about the um, glitches during the event. President Kim, uh, you have the floor. Yep. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm jong Un Kim, President of Fiscal Policy Institute. Uh, in this first session, uh, we had uh, three presentations. Uh, for the case of Korea, Mr. Uh, Pyong Jung Kang, uh, Director of Budget Management Division, Minister of uh, Economy and Finance. And then the second presentation, for the case of the US, Mr. Andrew Harrod, uh, Minister Counselor for Economic Affairs, US Embassy. So, and then uh, from Ireland, my friend Ronnie uh, Downs presented the case of Ireland. So thank you uh, for all these presentations. And we are in this uh, panel discussion, we are joined by uh, three discussants. Mr. Won Hin Lee, uh, president of Hangyong National University, and Mr. Tessak Lee, fellow of K uh, KDI, and uh, Mr. Sean Doty, online from Paris, senior advisor and head of secretariat, OECD network on fiscal relations. So let me invite you uh, for, to uh, intervene. Uh, hello, Sean, I, I see you on the screen. Are you joining us now? Pleasure to be here. Okay. Virtually in Seoul. Great. So, so we have about 30 minutes and three discussions. I heard that uh, for each discussion, uh, uh, you will have seven minutes each, and, and you will see the clock uh, out there. So let me now invite Mr. Won Hin Lee uh, for your discussion. Uh, discussion. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, president of a national university is acknowledged by the president, and I was acknowledged by the president uh, two weeks ago. So this is my first official opportunity to stand before an audience uh, after being appointed uh, as a president of my university. I was able to see a lot of similarities as I was listening to the presentations, and I was quite intrigued, intrigued by what was mentioned. So I have a number of questions prepared as well. COVID-19. I think, has the characteristics of being unpredictable and that it was spread very rapidly. So as the pandemic was spreading rapidly, the only way that we could respond was through non-face-to-face -face ways. So this non-face-to-face -face response actually, when we think about the democratic and capitalistic ways that we had, was quite different. Because in the past, we had to meet democratically and within our capital system, we had to meet. But within the pandemic, we had to have a different approach. So we were within a crisis. And as we were trying to overcome the crisis, I think, well, two key words come to mind. First of all, we had to be agile. And number two, we needed resilience. These two keywords, social scientific keywords, um, how can they be applied to our situation? Well, first of all, I told you that we met non-face to face in such a time, uh, fiscal policy and fiscal response was very important. Well, we could see that gross demand went down and we needed a Keynes theory-based gross demand policy to promote the demand. In Korea, there are about 6 million uh, businessmen who own their own business. Uh, 
And so, because they were forced into non-face-to-face -face operations, we had to apply a support system to the self-employed, to the ones who were most impacted by the pandemic. And at the same time, we had a low interest rate policy to support them. In Korea, there is adrenal accounting and the special accounting. But aside from that, there is a special funding that was prepared. And so we had the pin set approach. In other words, we pinpointed the ones who needed the support. And so we targeted them. We had a targeted approach targeting the most vulnerable and the hardest hit. I think what is most meaningful is that there was a close collaboration between the central government and the local governments. Now, when we first launched the local autonomous governments in Korea, there were concerns that the local governments would not be able to play an active role. But during the pandemic situation, we could see that indeed the local governments did play an important role through this collaboration. And so the heads of the local governments led the way in agile uh, response to the pandemic. We had the quarantine facilities that were prepared by the local governments. We had the drive-through testing facilities prepared by the local governments. It was the local rural areas that first came up with these facilities for testing of COVID. So there was a close collaboration between the central and the local governments, which I think was quite meaningful in terms of our response to COVID-19. And also agile. I mentioned that this is important. So we were agilely responding. And at the same time, resilience was very important, as it was mentioned by many scholars. So well, in order to supply public good or in order to actively and swiftly respond, we needed the financial resources. We either had to raise the taxes, but if you don't have the time to raise the taxes, you have to issue government bonds or sovereign bonds. People do not like tax hikes. And also, people are concerned about the debt level of the nation going up. But if you do not have the financial resources, then you cannot provide the public goods. So this is actually a dilemma. But anyhow, because we were pressed for time, what we did was we opted for the latter. We issued debt, and that increased the debt. But how are we going to go back? So this is about restoration. And also, we talk about the threshold effect. Once the debt increases, there is there is a tendency not to uh, pay back uh, the debt or reduce the deficit. So you can say that in terms of the fiscal sustainability, rather than saying the soundness, I think that the fiscal sound sustainability is a right word to say this. But to ensure financial su sustainability, we are faced with a new challenge. So having said that, after listening to the cases of the US and Ireland, I was able to find some interesting points. And since we are here to exchange knowledge and experiences, I would like to raise some questions. Now, first of all, I listened to the US case, and there were many stimulus packages that were introduced in order to perk up the economy. So I were able to, I was able to find some similarities as well. Of course, because of different welfare policies, there were some differences. But overall, I think that looking at the stimulus package of the United States, we could see that there was a large scale uh, support. But what is the viewpoint for, of the United States in terms of fiscal deficit? Because these packages led to a big deficit. What is the US citizens' perspective about the increasing deficit? And when thinking about the sustainability, what kind of policy response the US preparing? And in terms of Ireland, well, this was quite interesting too. Well, you distinguished core expenditure and non-core expenditure. I thought that was quite interesting. And I, we need to consider the meaning of this classification. Well, for the core expenditure and non-core expenditure, how are the two managed? Could you elaborate on how they are managed? And I think it would be very helpful to Korea. And in the last part, you talked about fiscal rule in your last slide. And in the case of Korea, we have a ceiling. We are thinking about a ceiling on national debt to 60%. The National Assembly is against this. But in the case of Ireland, you are within the EU framework. So you talked about the fiscal rule of the EU. And 
In a crisis like we are experiencing now, and in responding to such a response, what are the thoughts about the fiscal rules from the perspective of the fiscal authority? And deciding on a ceiling or a fiscal rule in a particular nation, what would be some of your advice? We are in a crisis, and in the process of overcoming the crisis, the role of fiscal policy is indeed very important. And I think we have heightened awareness amongst the people. But in order to have sustainable fiscal policies, we need to think about how to go back to the pre-COVID-19 period in terms of resilience. And having gone through COVID-19, we need to monitor all of the policies that were in place. And we also need to think about the ma achievements that we have made. We should not just say that this was just an exception, but we need to share this to make sure that we facilitate such policies in the future. And I believe that this would be in line with the evidence-based policies that can be utilized. And so I hope that this experience is accumulated as evidence so that it could add to the wisdom of the future generations. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lee, let me now invite uh, Tessa Lee for your Thank you for having me. I'm the Tethali from KDI. Uh, uh, I, am, I am working on uh, public finance and social policy issues uh, such as the debt, uh, debt sustainability uh, management and uh, welfare uh, system reform to improve the quality of life and make, uh, increase the efficiency of the uh, uh, government spending. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, here, the well-organized uh, presentation on the uh, fiscal policy response of uh, Korea, U.S., and Ireland, and it's, uh, to better understand, uh, today I talk about uh, some uh, uh, international relation uh, using the, some real data, and I show. Uh, yesterday, I collected some uh, international data of the size of the uh, fiscal response and other related variables and try to share the, some uh, scatter plot and uh, try to make uh, some argument uh, based on that. So first graph shows the, some relation between the uh, size of the fiscal uh, response and the GDP per capita. So there, basically, there's just some positive relation. It's not very strong, but the wealthy country have a large response. So OECD average uh, fiscal response size relative to the uh, GDP is 15%, but the average worldwide average is 8%. So West country has a uh, large response. Why this uh, West country has large response? Uh, one explanation is the, uh, the spread of the COVID-19 is left in West countries. So, the red dot is the OECD country, and the, the blue dot is the uh, other uh, remaining country. So GDP per capita uh, OECD average is uh, 38,000 USD, and the uh, whole, the, the country that I crack is the 168 country average is the, uh, 14,000 USD. So OECD country uh, wealthier than the remaining world country. And COVID case uh, per million uh, people, uh, average of the OECD is uh, 32,000 cases, and uh, sorry, the remaining uh, the all the country average is the 15,000 country cases. So the uh, West country, West country has uh, more uh, compound cases. So uh, if you compare the, the uh, COVID case and the total deaths from the COVID and compare the, the size of the uh, fiscal response. So still there is some positive relation. So the larger epi epidemic spreads, the greater uh, the response case. So there's some relation. And the last graph that I, that I show is the, the relation between the debt to GDP ratio and the size of the uh, fiscal response. So uh, actually this relation is uh, stronger than the, the other uh, relations. So the country with more debt have uh, taken the stronger uh, policy response. 
So if you, if you uh, try to explain the, the size of the uh, physical policy response to the other variables, the relation between the, uh, the size of uh, physical response and the debt to GDP ratio is the strongest. So that means uh, the access to the financial market is uh, key uh, to decide the size of the uh, fiscal response. So that's, that's the relation uh, between the several variables and the uh, uh, size of the fiscal response. That is just, just uh, uh, correlation, not, uh, nothing about, about uh, the causation. So we can make uh, some story uh, to rationalize this relation and we can find uh, some lesson uh, from based on th that uh, storyline. So my storyline is so, something like that. So in West country, uh, economic ability and the mobility are high, so the, that caused the epidemic to spread rapidly. And th to mitigate the cost of the, the epidemic, uh, the positive side is the West country has a quite good uh, capital market access. So they can borrow more money from the capital market and use this fund to be more proactively to uh, mitigate the adverse effect of the uh, COVID-19. So that's the basic trend of overall. But as you see, the, the previous scatter plot, there's a huge uh, the variation. So uh, there's just some positive correlation, but the the, there's a, a great heterogeneity between the countries, so that depends on the, the size of the GDP and the, the manufacturing and the service sector structure, as well as the openness and uh, some kind of the uh, people's uh, attitude uh, to accommodate the government suggestion, something like that. So, a previous slide, uh, can I go back? Yeah, previous slide, uh, we can categorize some, uh, some countries. So basically, the, uh, the Korea and the Ireland has relatively small size of the fiscal response because the, we have uh, uh, fewer uh, confirmed cases. Uh, but the, uh, sorry, the, that, can, that will be the better. So, but the, the Japan and the Germany has relatively small uh, confirmed cases, but they have a relatively uh, uh, greater fiscal response because they have uh, good access to the capital market. So they can borrow the money to mitigate the, the shock and it's beneficial to borrow the money from the uh, capital market. So they can utilize that kind of the, the fiscal space to increase the overall welfare. And the U.S. and the, the Belgium has relatively uh, uh, more confirmed cases. They then make they need to increase the size of the fiscal uh, fiscal response. And Italy, uh, it uh, depends on the uh, quite a huge uh, portion of the tourism. So that makes the that increasing the, the size of the uh, the fiscal response of uh, Italy uh, greater. So, and one more thing that I want to emphasize, the, the, the Japan and Italy and the German has, have implemented relatively large fiscal uh, policy response. In those countries, the amount of the support using the contingent liabilities through the payment guarantee is relatively larger than uh, supporting within the budget. So contingent budget management uh, through the continuous uh, reco recovery support will be important uh, for securing the mid term uh, uh, fiscal soundness. Uh, like the Korea, uh, we also have the, uh, the relatively uh, large portion of the, the contingent uh, uh, liability. So uh, during the, the recovery process, we need to, uh, we need to uh, think about the continue, continued uh, the support to mitigate that kind of the uh, control to control the that kind of the contingent liability. So in order to the continuous sorry, access the financial market through the investors' uh, trust, the transparent and the uh, credible uh, fiscal uh, management is required. And I think the, the communication between the investment investors and uh, the government is will be getting more important and important. Thank you. Great. Uh, 
So let me now uh, invite uh, Sean Doherty. Um, uh, you have uh, several minutes. Thank Are you ready? Thank you yep. very much, uh, Chairman Kim. It's a pleasure to be here um, on the call with all of you and uh, virtually present at this meeting. And I found the, the discussive remarks also very interesting and stimulating, as well as the presentations by Mr. Kong, Mr. Harrop, and Mr. Downs. And I, I just make a few observations. Um, we recently done work through the OECD network on fiscal relations, looking at the response of countries um, to the crisis um, across levels of government. So I think uh, quite a few of the rest of presentations focused on the central government level. I was intrigued by the, one of the last comments um, by Mr. Lee, talking about the close cooperation in Korea between central and local governments, which is really critical. Um, a lot of the frontline response to the crisis was faced by local governments. They had to deal with public health issues, as well as confinement and quarantine and other types of social support in particular, which was uh, resource intensive. And many central governments came forward with considerable degrees of support. And in fact, in this respect, we often cite uh, Korea as one of the best examples in terms of proactive action. I think uh, the deputy minister highlighted this as one of the proudest achievements. And we would, we've often cited that in our, in our analysis in our, our uh, recent reports. Um, and I think w one thing that's very important, and I think there was clear reference to the previous financial crisis as well as to mayors, but we have also noticed that um, one of, I think, the, the distinguishing features of Korea is that they learned a lot from previous crises and they faced similar epidemics on a smaller scale not that long ago, and that helped to really prepare the system for a more active and clearer response. And that included on the public health side, such as willingness to wear masks and um, immediately follow through with social distancing, which helped to reduce the death toll drastically and really had a, a much better overall, I would say, health response, um, which I think was really important for, for the quality of the response. Now, looking forward, and I, I was happy to hear the, I would say, the, the phrase, learning to live with the virus, which is really important going forward. We need to reopen our economies. We need to reopen borders. Um, Korea's had a very good economic initial response and already achieved the level of output that it had prior to the crisis, which is really impressive. But in order to really re-enter and reintegrate with the global economy, it's really critical that these kinds of measures are able to be, um, I would say, followed through with clearly, and we need to be able to see a kind of, um, a broader um, copying of this type of, of good response. And one other thing that was learned, I think, from the global financial crisis is that the, the real um, potential drastic slowdown that you can experience um, if you over um, engage in austerity policies too soon, you withdraw fiscal support too quickly, or you don't support subnational governments and local governments that do a lot of the investment um, in, in our economies and particularly in the post-crisis type periods. And I think that some of the measures that, that Ireland has engaged in, in terms of distinguishing core and non-core are particularly interesting and help to establish credit, maintain credibility despite the increase in debt and this considerable amount of fiscal support that was provided um, across the economy. And one of the things that we've actually seen in some early data is that actually Ireland stands a little bit unique in that um, many governments, the subnational level, because they rely on property taxes, income taxes, actually, and, and there was a lot of, I would say, income support, their um, fiscal position has been quite good and that revenues have been held up pretty well. Um, Ireland, subnational governments, actually, the revenues fell quite a lot, but fortunately, the central government was ready to step in and provide this kind of, of financial and transfer support, which was really essential to ensure a good um, Good, good overall response and I think is, is uh, encouraging for exiting from recovery. And I, I want to say a few words about the United States, which I think is also really interesting, and the tremendous quantity of support is quite uh, impressive and it really stands out dramatically and it's been critical for the global economy to, I would say, maintain its good position. And, um, and this is, I think, you know, had been, you know, the long credibility and the scale of the U.S. has, has made that possible. Um, at the same time, there's been a lot of deaths in the United States um, from COVID um, for, for a wide variety of reasons, and it was it was complicated situation. It's a large federal country with heterogeneous policy response, and um, but uh, and I think going forward, it will be really important that we find a way 
in the U.S. to, I would say, find a good exit strategy and ensure that uh, the disease doesn't return and deaths don't increase too much um, going forward. And I think one of the, the key lessons I think that we've, we've heard and I think that I would emphasize is that maintaining a sufficient fiscal support is critical going forward and that is across levels of government. So in, ensuring that also the subnational governments has actually done better than many observers expected prior to the crisis, and that's because central governments have been very generous. They've, in, in general, in OECD countries, have stepped up and provided considerable fiscal and liquidity support, and this has allowed them to, I would say, maintain a good position in terms of their revenues, yeah, even though their expenditures have increased significantly. Many of them are actually in somewhat better or as good a fiscal position as they were prior to the crisis, which is really impressive, and so that, I think, is good for the frontline response and particularly for the investment response going forward. Central governments, of course, need to maintain credibility and thinking about their budgets. I think thinking about pre-legislating um, fiscal adjustment may be something that's worthwhile to think about to preserve credibility um, beyond some of the other techniques that, that we've heard. And then I think clear communications of actions in terms of going forward and, and post-crisis. Um, and um, well, I think that that's the, the, those are the main messages I wanted to to, to, to offer. And, and perhaps I'd be interested to know a little bit more about how the exit um, process is is planned and how you want to maintain um, the fiscal sustainability going forward as we as debt levels have increased dramatically for many central governments. And we want to think about how to I would say not reimpose fiscal rules, but find a, a good sustainable path going forward. Um, in many countries and in many systems, thinking about even rethinking some of those those principles and those um, strictures in order to to have a, a good sustainable economic recovery. L let me stop here, and I'm happy to intervene again if if there's any other questions. Great, thank you so much, Sean. Um, let me now. Uh, probably just for one or two minutes for each, uh, Mr. Lee asked the question uh, about the case of the United States and, and the case of uh, Ireland. Uh, maybe uh, can I ask uh, Mr. Herb uh, about the, the question raised by Mr. Lee, the, the how to respond to this uh, uh, kind of side effect of aggressive fiscal policy? Uh, that is a very good question, um, and it is also a uh, very uh, politically tinged question and also depends on how you view debt and deficits uh, more generally. Um, and so I cannot give you a firm answer for the United States now because this is something that is being debated among our policymakers um, within the administration and also within our Congress. It is part of the discussion that is ongoing as we look at the infrastructure bill that is now in front of the Hill, looking at what that costs and how it will be paid for. This is a debate we've had in the United States forever, um, certainly since the end of World War II, um, how to categorize uh, deficits in debt and what it means for further economic growth. Um, I think over the past uh, several years, uh, over the past two administrations, certainly in part due to uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, we have seen a greater willingness um, to engage in fiscal responses, um, those that have cost money and that have an impact on our deficit and our debt level. Uh, but the determination on what our next steps will be and whether we respond with greater stimulus and hope for greater growth in the future or try to rein in expenses or increase uh, revenues coming in, uh, that is something that our Congress and our administration are debating and discussing uh, really, literally, a, 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 as I'm speaking. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harrop. Um, Ronnie, uh, can I ask you maybe for just one or two minutes uh, to respond to Mr. Lee's question? Thank you. Uh Chairman Kim, and it's good to see you again. And, uh, they have indeed been some very good uh, questions uh, raised by uh, the, the speakers. Uh, just to give some quick responses, I guess uh, 
First of all, I mean, Ireland is in, you know, a, a very different position. Uh, we're a small, open uh, economy, um, a very different position from a country like uh, the United States, you know, which uh, has its own fiscal uh, firepower available to it. And uh, the, the real lesson that we have learned over the past decade is the importance of maintaining our credibility, including with the international markets. So. Um, I think some of the, the scatter graphs uh, about uh, different countries' responses can be a little bit um, can be a little bit deceptive when it comes to Ireland because uh, the, the traditional measure of GDP uh, that that is relevant for most countries around the world is uh, is not not the best measure for Ireland because uh, it's the, the GDP figure is just too big for Ireland because we have a lot of multinational corporations. So if you if you use a figure of um, GNI gross national income or modified gross national income, uh, in fact the scale of Ireland's uh, pandemic response or our fiscal response is is very high, and it, it the reason it's so high is because we well we have been able to borrow we we've had to borrow a lot of money uh, for this uh, major fiscal response, <clears throat> and that's why we we do put a lot of for us, credibility and sustainability is a precious thing. It's a precious commodity, <clears throat> and uh, we have a good reputation in the international markets from having been through the difficult decade that we have been through. Um, on the question about core, non-core expenditure, uh, for us, it's a very practical way of managing um, the, the, you know, the difficult circumstances and the exceptional circumstances. Uh, if we make it clear in people's minds <clears throat> from the outset, if we make it clear to people that the COVID supports are just temporary, they're not here forever, uh, it means that when we have our annual budget discussions, as we have, we have just had over the last couple of months, when we have our annual budget discussions with uh, the line ministries, uh, we're talking to them about the core expenditure and how much the core expenditure is going to have to increase uh, you know for for inflation or for wages in the year ahead we're not engaging in negotiations about the non-core expenditure so we're making it very clear that that is going to uh, disappear as the pandemic uh, recedes and uh, by placing the focus on the core expenditure for our fiscal planning um, that uh, gives a gives visibility for the medium term about uh, about where we're going and uh, how our sustainability is going to be assured. And uh, I guess, and, and that has been quite successful for us. Uh, so all of our political discussions have been really focused on um, the, the underlying core expenditure. And we're, we're in the phasing out stage for the, uh, the non-core exceptional expenditure. Uh, and this is relevant also for the other question about uh, fiscal rules. Uh, interest, I'm interested to hear that uh, there's a debate going on in uh, in Korea about uh, you know what's an appropriate fiscal rule, a debt rule, or whatever it might be, and um, I, I I can't give advice. I'm afraid to uh, different countries will have different rules that work for them, but uh, I can share our experience here, uh, which is that um, you know recently we have uh, we have focused upon a set of national fiscal rules that work for us. Uh, I think the key word is simplicity. Uh, you can have all sorts of wonderful technical, um, technocratic uh, rules and formulas, uh, but if people don't understand them, politicians and citizens don't understand them, they're, perhaps they're not going to last uh, in times of stress. So the rule that we have fixed on as a, a fiscal anchor into the future is a rule that our core expenditure is going to is going to grow uh, no faster than it's going to grow in line with our trend economic growth rate, which is about five percent a year. Um, so the politicians know we built that into our uh, projections into the future. Uh, the politicians know that uh, whatever happens, that's the rule we're going to stick with. Um, there's no point looking for six or seven percent expenditure because we can't afford it. Uh, but we can afford to, to keep spending growing in line with uh, economic uh, growth, and that's what we're doing. And in our experience, when you focus on a rule like that, that people will, will stick to, 
uh, other things like the debt, uh, the national debt, will take care of themselves over time. Um, the difficulty with a debt limit, uh, it, th there is a debt figure of 60% 60, 60 of GDP in the EU framework. Um, the difficulty is, uh, you know, with the best will in the world, in exceptional circumstances, you're going to go above that debt from time to time. And then the question is, how do you come back down to below that debt again in the future? Whereas, as I say, if you focus on keeping expenditure growth sustainable and stable, things like uh, the deficit and the debt should take care of themselves over time. That will be uh, my experience. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Okay, uh, let me just uh, give you a very uh, brief uh, concluding remark. Uh, for the past 12 years, we uh, had uh, two global economic crises. Uh, and in 2008 uh, global economic crisis, I think it can be said that governments uh, reluctantly uh, engaged in expansionary uh, fiscal policy, which resulted in uh, too early uh, austerity measurement uh, uh, afterwards, and which was criticized by IMF officially. Maybe because of that lesson uh, uh, for this economic crisis, um, I think almost all uh, OECD countries were uh, really uh, deterministically uh, engaged in uh, expansionary uh, fiscal policy. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, probably we are in much better uh, uh, economic condition now uh, compared to the case when we didn't uh, really engage in expansionary uh, fiscal policy as much as we have done um, uh, so far. Um, so uh, I think each crisis is disastrous and, and sad, but we all of course, we learn something from the past crisis, and even for this crisis, I think uh, many countries, and, and especially for Korean government, I think we have learned um, how to uh, better protect uh, the vulnerable, uh, the small uh, business owners, uh, irregular workers. I think this time, uh, next time, I think we are much better prepared to expand our social security network because of the experience we have uh, had for the past two years. So, um, so far, I think uh, it can be said that, uh, including Korea, the, the fiscal response to the economic crisis caused by COVID-19 was much better than the one in 2008. But of course, we now have side effect of accumulating a government debt, which will be, I think, will be discussed in the second session. So. So thank you all uh, uh, for your uh, presentations and, and discussions, and let me conclude uh, this session now. Thanks. Thank you very much for your great uh, discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give another round of applause for the speakers and discussants, including Mr. Harrop. Yes. Now, let's take a short break, about 10 minutes, and the next session will resume under the theme of post-COVID-19, rethinking the role of fiscal policy. Now we're holding a very special event during the break for our online participants. If you screenshot your monitor with your R program on the screen and post that screenshot with some comments on KDI's Facebook event page, we'll send a souvenir to a few selected participants. You can win a very special gift that we have prepared, so I would like to ask all of you to participate in a special promotion. Now, uh, please enjoy your break, and I'll see you again uh, shortly. Thank you very much for your cooperation.
잠시 후 세션 2가 시작. We shall resume for session 2 shortly. We would like to ask you to please come inside and take your seats. Session 2 will begin shortly. I would like to kindly ask you to come into the venue and be seated. Thank you for your cooperation. We will soon begin session two shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, please come inside and take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Session two of today's event will begin shortly. Please kindly be seated for our next session. Thank you for your cooperation. Welcome back, everyone. Now let's begin the second session of the ninth Global Fiscal Forum. The title of session two is Post-COVID-19, Rethinking the Role of Fiscal Policy. The first speaker is Gyeonghee University Professor Hyung Na Oh, and she'll deliver a presentation on Post-COVID-19 2022 Green Fiscal Policies in South Korea. Please allow me to invite her over to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give her a big hand. Thank you all organizers, um, KDI, the Minister of Economy and Finance and the OECD for inviting me to this timely event. Uh, I will talk about uh, 2020 post-COVID-19 uh, fiscal policies in South Korea. First, let me describe the background of uh, Korea's green fiscal policy. Uh, in the last decade, South Korea proposed a concept of green uh, fiscal policy to supply, I mean, to support the green, uh, green growth financially. And uh, as the a, a G20 meeting in Toronto in 2010, 
uh, declared the distance from the Keynesian approach. Uh, so the green fiscal policy disappeared from the mainstream of uh, academia and uh, political space. This concept has come to the poor point uh, of fiscal policy domain as a part of a Green New Deal uh, to kill two birds, um, the climate change and the COVID economic downturn uh, with the one stone, that is green code. Uh, so as you can see, we, ha we also experience economic downturn even though the level is much, much, much better than uh, that of other OECD countries. South Korea became the first East Asian uh, country uh, who embraced the, the Green New Deal. The Korean Green New Deal is mainly planned to cut greenhouse gas emissions according to the IPCC special report uh, to tackle the climate change within the 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. Uh, the, after the announcement of Korean Green New Deal in July 2020, the government also pledged uh, to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 uh, our new indices of 40% of reduction goal uh, by 2030 compared to uh, our 2018 level uh, will be announced at uh, COP26 in Glasgow very soon. This figure shows the amount of greenhouse gas emissions increased over time. Uh, its emission ranking, our emission ranking was the eighth largest in 2018, and now the ranking is a little bit uh, lower than before. Uh, so the South Korea has faced the global international pressure to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emission levels. To achieve the carbon neutrality by 2050 and uh, 2030 uh, NDC target, the Korea's emission level should be reduced by 4.17% annually. Uh, in terms of average annual growth rate from the peak, which is assumed uh, to, a, to the, uh, the emission level in 2018 in Korea, uh, this reduction rate, 4.17%, uh, has never been observed in history under the normal economic condition. You can see that in addition to the main goals of Korean Green New Deal, which is the decarbonization and recovery from the electric economic downturn, uh, there are other, uh, some inclusive growth-related goals, like uh, high-quality jobs and reducing inequality and providing affordable housing, and those social and justice issues are included in uh, Korean Green New Deal, in specifically the this year version, Green New Deal 2.0 version. And in terms of policy tools, uh, it also, uh, 2.0 version also includes the market-based approach like a carbon pricing or emission trading scheme. But uh, in uh, Green New Deal 2.0 version uh, of Korea as well as uh, that of uh, United States and the EU, uh, they emphasize on the, uh, the green public, I mean public investment and uh, the it's, a, it's expenditure and investment. That is the, the kind of stylized factor of the, the version two Green New Deal uh, observed in anywhere in the world. So the second issue is the 2020, uh, actually 2022 uh, Green Fiscal Policy Plan in South Korea. Uh, this figure uh, illustrates four components of Green Fiscal Policy Framework. So you can see a uh, budget and uh, the on earmarked uh, fund, which is a climate response fund. Uh, so the, the fiscal year budget uh, flows to this uh, the, the fund every year, and also we have inflows and outflows, and the inflow sources are somewhat different. So it includes some Pigovian style taxes and the 
uh, revenues uh, by selling allowances uh, of emission trading scheme. So that means that in terms of raising the revenue, the uh, carbon pricing is emphasized in green fiscal uh, policies. And the spending, the main spending sectors are also carbon uh, sectors which is related to carbon neutrality and just the transition mechanisms uh, which support individuals and local communities facing high transition costs due to the green transition. And finally, we have the fourth component, which is a, a fiscal, I mean, public financial management uh, mechanism, in short, the carbon budget, which evaluates the uh, fiscal plans based I mean, from the carbon neutrality pers perspective. Uh, let's look at the 2022 uh, green fiscal policy uh, with this table. Um, 13.3 trillion won, uh, or about 11.3 billion US dollars, will be allocated to the Korean Green New Deal, in short, KGND. Uh, about 90% of 2022 green budget is devoted to carbon neutrality specifically. And uh, compared to 2021 plan, the Green New Deal budget will increase by 29%. Point, uh, point one percent, which is really big jump from the previous year. Uh, the, while the, the uh, overall budget is proposed to increase by 8.3%, and actually this number is also above uh, the increasing rates uh, the, in Irish, uh, I mean in Ireland, which is addressed in the previous session. This increased budget and new climate uh, response fund are the, the uh, signs that the uh, Korean fiscal policy is moving toward the green. And this slide shows the sources of climate response fund and which sectors are supported by, uh, financially supported by this earmarked fund. Uh, fund. So uh, I'm going to skip this one. Let me illustrate several issues uh, that need to be discussed when adjusting the fiscal plan. The first issue is the size of a green budget. Uh, while the Korea's annual uh, reduction target is pretty high, as I said, it is 4.17% annually, the uh, absolute and the relative size of green spending is smaller than that of the Germany and the UK the countries, they already achieved some level of uh, greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, given the upward trend of greenhouse gas emissions in Korea, which is shown the last figure at the, at the bottom of this slide, um, and the limited carbon market uh, mechanisms raising the private sector uh, green financing, the Korea's green, I mean, public fiscal spending should be larger than the current level in order to achieve the two announced goals, the carbon neutrality by 2050 and the NDC by 2030. Allocation issues also exist. Uh, as other countries, energy production and use contribute most by far uh, to overall emissions, uh, as shown in gray area. So it, it, you can see that the proportion of uh, the energy sector to the overall uh, greenhouse gas emission is very close to 90%. Uh, so the decarbonizing energy sector is critical in green transition. Unfortunately, the energy transition has not been promising in Korea. Uh, so far, the proportion of renewable energy, which is shown with this, fi uh, this uh, figure, uh, is only uh, 6% a lot lower than the OECD average of 26%. We have a long way to go to reach our uh, renewable energy goals, which are sp uh, stipulated by uh, two 2050 uh, net zero scenarios, and one is 60.9%, and the other one is 70.8% by 2050. So there is a big gap between the current level and the goals. Uh, so the proportion of fiscal spending 
uh, for renewable energy supply, which is uh, the, this, the, the fiscal plan for 2022 is about 2.5 percent. So this proportion uh, seems to be very low to get the uh, carbon neutrality by 20. 2050 and even, uh, I mean, much harder to get uh, MDC by 2030. Considering high dependency on carbon intensive manufacturing industries and a lack of natural resources to, uh, to produce renewable energy, hydro, uh, renewable energy, the hydrogen energy supply and its application into the industrial production process is a critical component of Korea's decarbonization. However, a budget aiming at developing green hydrogen tech is small, while the budget for uh, efficient EV purchase subsidy accounts for the lion's share of the, uh, the, the uh, 2022 green uh, budget. So the, you, you can see some portion there, 31% of uh, 2022 green budget goes to the subsidy for the uh, FC EV car purchase. Uh, this plan seems to be nurture uh, FC uh, EV vehicles as a new gross engine for post COVID, uh, but uh, the fiscal spending focusing on green hydrogen production tech need to be treated with uh, a lot uh, more weight uh, in the future uh, fiscal plan. Uh, supporting innovation activities in the production process is a necessity in achieving dual goals, carbon neutrality and globally competitive Korean manufacturing sectors. Uh, because the innovation usually occurs in the production process part, uh, the compared to the importance of innovation in the production process, the budget in 2022 fiscal uh, plan uh, is uh, less than 10 percent, which is colored uh, blue. As I said earlier, the Korean Green New Deal 2.0 contains some inclusiveness issue. Uh, just transition is the most prominent one. So in 2022, uh, the, the budget for just transition is about 552 billion won. Uh, that is more than doubled compared to the 2021 level, but given the high dependency on carbon in intensive industrial sectors, the, the fiscal need or fiscal demand for just transition will increase in the near future. Okay. And uh, so far, uh, the, uh, we talked about uh, which sectors should get more allocation, but uh, there is one sector that the fiscal demand or fiscal expenditure should be reduced, that is subsidies for fossil fuel uh, use. So far, we talked about the outflow side of the green fiscal policy. Uh, some are concerns about inflows of the green fiscal policy since we do not have a solid plan to adopt the carbon uh, taxes and the allowance prices, which is shown uh, on the plot, are uh, unstable and uh, relatively low nowadays. If the inflows system is not improved, an increase in green outflows will damage fiscal sustainability. So this is why the Korean government is con uh, considering uh, tax reforms and reflecting carbon costs on electricity prices, but the progress is still uh, is, 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 is quite questionable. So another measure, uh, another measure to ensure uh, fiscal sustainability will be the carbon budget or a carbon uh, public financial management system that evaluates the public project based on fiscal uh, efficiency and the carbon neutrality rules. This carbon, bu uh, carbon budgeting is important at this moment because uh, more than 60% of green fiscal uh, expenditure were green, uh, green New Deal uh, project uh, are implemented with the subsidies, direct subsidies. Uh, 
uh, if the efficiency of Green New Deal fiscal spending or the positive impacts of green fiscal expenditure or total factor productivity improves, uh, then, the, uh, then the total factor productivity stagnates and inflows and outflow ratio will be worsened in the future. So uh, under this situation, fiscal sustainability supporting the continuation of the Korean Green New Deal cannot be maintained. So in this sense, the impacts of green fiscal policies on total factor productivity in addition to the, carb the impacts on carbon neutrality or the fiscal efficiency, uh, the, the must be maintained in uh, the carbon budget evaluation uh, mechanisms, including uh, the carbon budgeting or Korean uh, green taxonomy. Finally, I will talk about the impacts of Korean Green New Deal on jobs. The Korean Green New Deal will create in several sectors listed here, and some are find, uh, purely environmental, and some sectors are combined with the uh, digital transition. And according to the labor force survey in Korea, seven sectors recorded the largest number of jobs, as well as the largest number of new jobs since 2015, uh, during the Korean Green New Deal 1.0 period, which is the first period of Green New Deal and also the first year of a uh, pandemic. Uh, the, uh, the six out of seven uh, promising sectors are related to uh, Korean Green New Deal. Uh, those are power uh, generation, waste management, recycling, construction engineering services, and two technology service sectors, which are uh, colored pink. These six sectors uh, provided about 27,000 new jobs and plan to hire more in the future. However, these new jobs are mostly public sectors and uh, some are jobs in the informal sectors, uh, which are unlikely to be high-quality high jobs. So as Professor Roderick uh, at Harvard University addressed in a KDI conference, recent conference, the, the uh, high quality jobs or the uh, innovation, effective innovations are generated by private sector. That means the law of the green fiscal policy is to pave the ex express way, not driving the express way by itself. So that should be done by uh, private sector. So when you look at the 2020 two fiscal plan and also the a little bit longer plan to uh, 2050, the Minister of Strategic Finance include financial, uh, private sector financing in green, uh, green uh, fiscal plan, so which is, uh, is 220 trillion won in total by 2025. So uh, I hope this trend is, is, is enhanced in the future. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your detailed and great uh, presentation, Professor O. Oh. And next, we're going to have the second presentation by Christoph Bess, Minister, Councillor, and Head of the Trade and Economy Section Delegation of the European Union to the Republic of Korea. He'll brief us on the green fiscal policies in the EU fit for 55 package and recovery and resilience facility. Please allow me to invite him over to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a big round of applause. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Deputy Minister, um, Song Dae Choi, Che. Uh, dear President uh, Zhang Pyo Hong of KDI, distinguished speakers and guests, uh, as COP26 is just about to start in Glasgow, Europe is one of the front runners on the pathway towards a climate neutral and resource efficient economy, with our goal of achieving climate neutrality by 2050 and our renewed ambition of reducing 2030 CO2 emissions levels by 55% as compared to 1990 levels. 
In December 2019, we put forward the European Green Deal, the new EU growth strategy. This is a set of deeply transformational policies for increasing the EU's climate ambition, preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity, and creating a zero pollution ambition for a toxic-free environment. Our ambitions for the decarbonization and the 55% reduction target were enshrined in the adoption of the European Climate Law in June 2021. Consequently, this updated 2030 emissions reduction target has required an update on the EU's main climate, energy and transport legislation. This is the so-called Fit for 55 package put forward by the Commission in July this year. How does it work? Yep. So, Fit for 55 entails changes across a range of policy areas and economic sectors, climate, energy and fuels, transport, buildings, and land use and forestry. The Emissions Trading System, ETS, is the core instrument for this ambition by reducing the emissions cap and by extending its sectoral coverage, including in transport and buildings. As the ETS may lead to an increase in carbon price differences with the EU's trading partners, leading to an increased risk of carbon leakage, the Commission is proposing to create a carbon border adjustment mechanism, the famous CBAM. You may have heard about this in Korea. I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on this. So CBAM will mirror the EU emissions trading system, the ETS. It will comply with WTO and be fully in line with international trade rules. CBAM will focus on carbon intensive sectors. In the first phase, up to 2026, CBAM will concern the following sectors cement, iron and steel, aluminium, fertilizers, and electricity. Uh, these sectors are estimated to cover around 45% of the CO2 emissions in the EU. CBAM will only apply to the proportion of emissions that do not benefit from free allowances under the EU ETS. In the first phase, CBAM will only collect information on actual emissions, which means that no money will be collected. And then, from 2026, CBAM will uh, replace free allowances under the EU ATS and uh, is phased in gradually as free allowances are phased out. The Fit for 55 package also proposes to increase the ambition in the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Directives and lays down rules on aviation, maritime fuels and proposes new sectoral goals in the CO2 in cars. Additionally, to address any social impact that arise from the extension of the ETS to buildings and road transport, the Fit for 55 package introduces a social climate fund which will aim to finance both temporary direct income support for affected vulnerable households, as well as support national measures and investments that reduce costs for vulnerable households, micro-enterprises, and transport users. The EU's commitment to the green transition will require an immediate and sustained high level of investments. Implementing the Fit for 55 package and its ambitions in increased carbon pricing is therefore of paramount importance. It would mean increasing investor certainty 
in the green transition and reducing the risk of locking in investments in carbon intensive industries that will become obsolete before too long, leading to stranded assets. As such, the package as a whole enables the EU to enforce new green standards and unlock the much needed medium and long term investments in the green transition. The post COVID economic recovery is our common challenge of this time and it is at the forefront of the EU's policy efforts. Focusing on resources on the economic recovery does not mean that the climate and biodiversity crises have disappeared, nor our goals forgotten. It is the opposite. Investments in the recovery and the green transition are complementary. Boosting circular economy, investing in renewable energy projects, renovating buildings and infrastructure and promoting clean mobility can support economic recovery, growth and jobs. As such, the European Green Deal underpins the policy for a recovery path. In the context of Europe's climate ambition, member states should consider reforms and investments to support the climate transition as a matter of priority. The EU stands by to make available uh, the support to ensure that member states recover from the crisis and to help them address the green and digital transitions. To support member states in their recovery efforts, the EU adopted an unprecedented recovery package. On top of the reinforced long-term EU budget, which amounts to more than 1 trillion euros for the period 2021-2027, this package also includes the next generation EU which is a package of uh, 750 billion uh, euros of recovery instrument, raising financing from the financial markets. Of the 750 billion available under the recovery instrument, 672 billion will be invested under the recovery and resilience facility, of which Approximately half will be grants and half will be loans. All national recovery and resilience plans prepared to fulfill the conditions to access the recovery and resilience facility will need to focus strongly on both reforms and investments supporting the climate and digital transition. Overall, national recovery and resilience plans should contribute 37% of the total amount of expenditure foreseen to support EU climate objectives as part of the green transition and 20% to the digital transformation. Let me provide a bit more detailed overview of the EU recovery and resilience facility. The recovery and resilience facility is part of the recovery package approved by the European Council in uh, July 2020, and it includes the next generation EU recovery instrument which I mentioned earlier, and the reinforced long-term EU budget for 2021-2027, which amounts to approximately 1 trillion euros. The bulk of the money raised for the next generation EU recovery instrument will be invested under the recovery and resilience facility. The recovery and the resilience facility envelope will be accessible if a member state prevents, uh, sorry, presents a national recovery and resilience plan with a reform and investment agenda 
that effectively addresses medium to long-term structural challenges identified in the relevant country-specific recommendations. The recovery and resilience plans have to fulfill several other criteria, including to contribute significantly to green and digital transition. The member states have taken these obligations forward with ambitious programs that will directly benefit citizens across Europe. We have now adopted 16 national plans and work is ongoing on the others. On average, the plans so far have gone beyond these minimum targets and plan to spend around 40% on climate related and around 27% on digital measures. In terms of content, most plans contain investment schemes that support climate-friendly renovations of residential or public buildings. Many plans also contribute to build up electric or hydrogen charging infrastructure or support renewable public transport. The plans also provide support to renewable generation as well as production of renewable hydrogen. In terms of digital content, we see the rollout of improved fiber networks and 5G infrastructure, modernization, and improvement of public administration and public services, and measures to improve digital skills of workers and civil servants. In addition to this requirement for the overall plans, every individual measure will need to respect the do no significant harm principle in relation to the environmental objectives. This way it will be ensured that the key elements of climate change, adaptation, climate change, mitigation, pollution control, water, biodiversity, and circular economy principles are all respected. Let us look back at the last 18 months. When the epidemic broke out, there was a lot of uncertainty and anxiety on how the world would handle this epidemic and on its economic impact. The fear was real that the world would enter into a great depression, comparable to, if not surpassing, that of 1929. In fact, the world managed to develop quite rapidly suitable vaccines. And on the economic side, governments and central banks activated all the levers at hand, relaxing monetary and fiscal policies. At the expense of ballooning public debt, the Great Depression has been avoided, and GDP growth is expected to reach around 6% in the EU and in the world in 2021. The challenge that we are facing now is that of inflation, overheating, of supply chain disruptions, and of energy price rises. In response to that, let me underline that priority should be given to targeted measures that can rapidly mitigate the impact of price rises for vulnerable consumers and small businesses. These measures should be easily adjustable in the spring of 2022 when the situation is expected to stabilize. Our long-term transition investment in cleaner energy sources should not be disrupted by the necessity to address this temporary energy crisis. We want to avoid a price salary loop, and this will request macroeconomic fine tuning. Actually, in the EU, we analyze the current energy crisis 
as a consequence of our over-reliance on fossil fuel energies, notably gas, hence the necessity to reinforce our investment in renewables. Below are the immediate measures to protect consumers and businesses suggested by the EU to its member states in response to the energy crisis. Provide emergency income support for energy poor consumers. Authorize temporary deferrals of bill payments. Put in place safeguards to avoid disconnections from the grid. Provide temporary targeted reductions in taxation rates for vulnerable households. I understand that in Korea too, you are considering uh, such type of uh, measures. Provide aid to companies or industries in line with EU state aid rules. Enhance international energy outreach to ensure transparency, liquidity and flexibility of international market. And so on and so forth. So the, the, let me conclude that the aim is not to get us back to where we were before the crisis, but to take a leap into the future. We must turn the challenge of the crisis into an opportunity, not only by supporting the recovery, but also by investing in the next generation, the green and digital transitions, all the key to Europe's future prosperity. The resilience of our societies and the health of our environment. Europe is going through a profound transformation driven by climate change and by digitalization that will be supported by our recovery efforts. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your elegant presentation, Minister uh, Councillor, and I wish uh, the best of luck in Europe's efforts to take a leap towards the future. We have one last presentation for session two, and the third presenter is Eric Kla, head of the Fiscal Policy Division, Federal Ministry of Finance in Germany, and he'll deliver a presentation on German's fiscal policy post-corona, and we're going to connect to him virtually. Hello, Mr. Klaw. Hello. Yes. Uh, I hope you can hear me well and you can see me. Yes, we can. We do not see you yet, but I believe we will. Yes, we can. Please go ahead okay. with your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the German Federal Ministry of Finance, I would like to express my deep gratitude to the Korean Ministry of Economics and Finance for this invitation to this very distinguished forum. And I would like to congratulate you, the Ministry, the KDI and the OECD on the excellent conference that I've been able to follow here from the beginning, rather early this morning, Berlin time at 7, 7.30. And I'm honored and uh, I cherish the opportunity to be able to present to you and share with you some of the current economic and fiscal outlooks that we have and to speak about probable fiscal priorities in the upcoming uh, legislative period in Germany. I will now try to present my screen to you so that you can see my presentation from here. I hope you can see it now. Do you see my presentation? Could you give me short feedback? Is it is it uh, is it available for you? Because I cannot see right now if you can see my presentation. We can see your presentations. Excellent. Thank yes. you very much. Mm -hmm. So uh, just a short outline. I will uh, quickly go through the first part of the presentation and show you some of the economic and fiscal projections of the federal uh, German government for the upcoming years. 
and spend a bit more time on the second part about achieving the digital and, and uh, carbon neutral transformation uh, with a focus on the role of public investment uh, in the process. Um, I have to start my presentation with a, a short disclaimer because as some of you may know, we are currently in a transition from the caretaker government to a new federal government. Uh, federal elections took place in Germany uh, about a month ago and we currently are having negotiations over a new coalition. Um, if the timetable is confirmed that it's currently uh, projected, we should have a new government in office sometime early December, um, but uh, negotiations are a tricky process and uh, um, it might be somewhat later in December depending on, on how, it, how it continues. Uh, that said, um, the, the outgoing uh, administration has presented a draft federal budget for 2020 and uh, the medium term uh, financial plan for the, for the following three years uh, in June. And uh, the incoming government will present an amended budget draft to parliament, probably sometime in the first quarter of 2022. Um, uh, so the, the current draft budget uh, has not been presented to parliament yet. That is the, the normal process uh, in election uh, years. So uh, that means that final budget numbers and also, of course, fiscal priorities will differ from what I present you today. I hope I'll be able to make a, a presentation close enough to, to what you're going to see uh, coming out of uh, the new government uh, starting next year. Um, just shortly, because that is not, uh, not so important, um, because that, that has been actually been the focus of the session, uh, session one, uh, a bit of a back look on how the how the situation and during the crisis affected Germany. You can see here on the the downturn that we had in 2020. It was about 4.6 percent of real GDP. Um, um, recovery is a bit slower than we expected earlier this year, which has to do with some supply side uh, problems that um, I think everybody knows about. Uh, supply chain problems, uh, problems in, uh, in manufacturing sector with uh, with bottlenecks uh, in, for example, chip uh, production, um, which has reduced uh, the recovery in the manufacturing sector, uh, which is uh, extremely export oriented in Germany, as you probably know. So we have currently, uh, only this week, uh, amended our um, our uh, economic projection, macroeconomic uh, forecast. And uh, we're expecting 2.6% of real GDP growth this year and 4.1% uh, next year. And then we'll come back to basically the trend uh, uh, growth that we've been having before the crisis hit. Um, the picture on the, um, uh, on the labor market is pretty much the same. Um, we had a rather minor impact after years of, of uh, re um, lower unemployment rates. Um, the unemployment rate increased by about one percentage points and the short time work scheme has been very effective again as it has been in the financial crisis uh, in 2008-2009 following years. Uh, so a large uh, 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 amount of jobs could be saved because people were going into short time. Um, we've expanded the provisions uh, for the short time work scheme. Um, to make it uh, accessible uh, more easily and to uh, reduce costs for employers. These uh, special provisions for the crisis will expire at the end of this year. And we're expecting uh, unemployment to be back on the pre-crisis track by sometime by 2022, which is, as you can see, about the same time as we're ex expecting re-GDP to be back on track. There are, of course, downward risks and upward risks as in any, uh, any forecast. Um, uh, supply chain disruptions could, uh, could, start, uh, could stay uh, a problem for longer, especially in the manufacturing sector. Of course, um, the question on whether there will be new virus variants that could, uh, could increase, again, the problems on, uh, on the global markets uh, with respect to the pandemic could be a problem. There's an up, upward risk. We have a lot of involuntary savings uh, during the past year and the first part of this year, which uh, means that there's a lot of pent up demand that, that might help uh, the recovery more quickly, uh, but also might be uh, driving inflation, which the colleague from uh, Mr. Bess has, has just mentioned before, could be a problem uh, going forward. 
Uh, just a quick look at tax uh, revenues. You can see here uh, the tax revenue path that we had before the crisis and the, the various um, forecasts that have been made since. Um, you can see that there's a, a margin that stays. So we're not going to go back to the tax revenues as we had them uh, uh, before the crisis hit. And that, of course, is a, is a problem for, um, for the fiscal planning in the future. Um, and it's something that the incoming government is going to have to address. Uh, there will be a new forecast uh, sometime mid-November of the Independent Working Party on tax revenue estimates that we're hoping to be implementing then in the in the budget uh, that the new incoming government is going to present. Just a short look here again. Um, this has also been the topic more or less of the of the presentations uh, uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, the impact of automatic stabilizers and discretionary. Um, fiscal measures on the fiscal balance uh, in Germany in the years of 2020 and uh, also this year. Uh, you can see that discretionary measures uh, played a significant role and they are also going to play a role again in 2022 when the, um, uh, the debt break and the provisions by the Stability and Growth Pact that were mentioned earlier are still uh, deactivated and uh, allow for larger deficits than would be uh, available in normal times. Um, here you can see a picture, uh, a, a table that shows you how the uh, basically the Maastricht, so the, the important uh, criteria for the, for the stability and growth pact, uh, structural balances of fiscal deficits and uh, debt to GDP ratios in, in Germany are projected to develop over the next couple of years. So we're going to have uh, an increase to this year to about 72% of GDP. This will go down again uh, in the coming years which is um, more, more um, well, it's basically driven by the, the strict uh, deficit rules that we have in Germany as, as compared to the, the ones that you have in the Stability and Growth Pact. Um, and I can show you this in a little more detail on that slide, which uh, shows you the, the downward path of, of the debt to GDP ratio in Germany and the, the, the factors that are driving it. And you can see the green, uh, the green columns that are showing you the impact of, uh, of projected GDP growth uh, to reducing the debt to GDP ratio. So that's basically the denominator of factor and uh, the deficits that we're still going to have changed to new debt in the blue columns. And you can see the new deficits are going to going down in Germany, which is again basically because we have a debt break uh, enshrined in our constitution that requires us to go back to basically uh, normal times again 2023, whereas the stability and growth pact in the, uh, in the European Union uh, and its medium term objective allows you uh, um, a pathway to, to your medium term objective, so your, your fiscal rule basically in the medium term which is not available in the, in the debt break uh, on a national level. So we have to reduce our deficits rather quickly, and we also have to start paying back debt uh, that we took on during the crisis. So this is going to present the new government with uh, several problems uh, for the fiscal plan, especially in the years 23 to 25. And um, uh, we imagine that this is currently one of the hotly debated topics in the negotiations uh, on forming the new government. That said, uh, let me come to the second part of my presentation, um, achieving the digital and ecological transformation and the role of public investment. I will say a little bit less about green investment, even though it's a huge, hugely important uh, topic in Germany as well, uh, simply because uh, the, my, the previous speaker have, have uh, already talked about this on the, on, from the perspective of Korea, and Mr. Bess has also presented many of the issues that we're dealing with in Germany in his presentation on the European uh, level. So I will, I will speak a bit more generally about public investment and then do a little decourse on, in, in the direction of digital transformation and innovation policy. Um, first of all, um, the, the, the outgoing government, and I believe this is going to be true in any case for the, for the incoming administration, has placed a huge uh, uh, emphasis on um, transformative public investment. You can see here a uh, um, um, graphic uh, that shows you the, the increase in the federal government investment in the, in the past four years. That's the, the middle column. 
the last legislative period. Um, and you can see the large increase during the crisis, which has been a very much intentional. And I'll speak a little, little bit more about that. Um, the idea is to keep uh, federal investment, which accounts for about 30%, 35% of total uh, public investment in Germany, the rest being uh, due to the, the uh, states and, uh, and the municipalities, um, to keep it at least on the level that, that it has been achieved during the crisis. Um, the line is flat here uh, for the upcoming years. That's simply because that's the usual uh, way of doing it in the financial plan. It will, of course, change uh, as an un incoming government uh, is, is going into more detail on the, on the years 23 and uh, subsequent. So uh, I already said the, the public investment has been a large part of the crisis response, as many um, uh, speakers on this conference before have, have already explained for their countries. Uh, we had a so-called future pack package as part of the overall stimulus package that the government implemented to, to fight the crisis, uh, which placed uh, a big emphasis on accelerating the modernization and expanding medium-term growth potential of the economy. And I've listed here a few of the measures that have been taken uh, uh, in this, in this uh, future package, which uh, included investments to ensure energy transition, to comply with climate commitments, prepay, uh, promote sustainable mobility, so for example in, in railways, uh, provide better protection against future pandemics, the investment in hydrogen technology and the infrastructure that is required to, to use it, and uh, as I said, I will come back to this later, to, to foster digital innovation in the private sector and in public administrations. Um, the view of the current uh, outgoing government, and as I said, probably the next one is that public investment is, is going to be absolutely crucial for speeding up uh, the necessary economic uh, uh, recovery and uh, the medium term growth uh, opportunities for, for our economy. Um, there are numerous studies being uh, discussed right now also during the formation of the new government in Germany to to assess the probable uh, uh, volume of investment, both private and, and public, to uh, achieve the climate targets. Um, um, investments are, are uh, differing. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty right there. You have uh, figures between maybe 10 and 35% of total investment that is going to be required to, to achieve uh, climate uh, uh, CO2 neutrality by 2045, which is the current uh, German uh, um, target. And uh, what's absolutely clear though, is that um, public investment is going to have to increase in order to, to meet the achievements. And we have this dual role that some of the speakers have also already tapped upon. Uh, that you have uh, uh, investment in, in public uh, capital stock infrastructure, basically, but also in bridging the costs for the for the companies in order to to make the uh, the uh, the jump to to carbon neutrality, and that is going to require some kind of subsidies, um, which are also going to cost uh, public money. Um, we expect. Um, some crowding in of private investment uh, as a result of transformative public investment. That's something maybe that's been viewed differently in the past, where crowding out effects of, of public investment have been more in the front of attention. Uh, we believe that uh, that uh, public investment in, in, uh, in a climate neutral economy can trigger subsequent private investment and that the effect is also stronger during recessions and in time of time and uncertainty which was another reason why uh, it has been uh, an important element of the um, of the stimulus package that the government implemented uh, in 2020. So it can reduce uh, uncertainty in times of crisis and disruption and be, a, be an uh, important signal to the private sector. There are also some issues that uh, relate to investment in certain lighthouse projects. Uh, I've mentioned the hydrogen uh, technology um, or that might uh, involve massive investments that are too too big for for private firms to undertake and thereby um, uh, have a, a role for for public investment as well. And finally, and then I come back to this in a bit more detail later, investing in research and development uh, in technologies that might not not already be in place, uh, which are 
still require to meet our climate goals. Um, now, as I said, a little bit more about the question of digital transformation uh, and, uh, and infrastructure in that regard. Um, uh, unfortunately, Germany is, is ranking only mid-table in various digitization rankings, and there is a lot of untapped potential still in, in the expansion, both of digital infrastructure and the use of uh, digital technologies and services, uh, as well as digital skills that has been high on the agenda uh, for the government that is outgoing and is going to be so for the for the incoming administration as well. That is. Uh, can already be seen from results that we have from uh, from preliminary talks for the negotiations. Um, in the future package, let me say a few things about that. There has been a lot of uh, stimulus for uh, digital infrastructure that included a lot of uh, additional investment, in key digital technologies such as uh, AI, quantum technology, um, but also uh, in order to help public administrations, both on the federal and on the uh, lender and municipality levels, to digitize their administrations. Uh, that has been a problem also during the pandemic because uh, we noticed that uh, our federal healthcare system is not entirely digitized yet, and that has been bringing problems uh, in, in various regards in fighting the pandemic. And a lot of, uh, of money and resources have already gone into improving that uh, for the future also as a as a, as a safeguard against future uh, pandemics or other uh, situations in the federal health care system. Um, also, um, there is the issue of providing federal governments um, resources uh, to expand digital infrastructure in areas where private investment is not entirely forthcoming because it doesn't uh, uh, pay so well from a, from a business point of view. So that means you have uh, some areas, uh, so-called white white areas on the map, where uh, where certain uh, digital infrastructure is not provided by the private sector. And we have uh, implemented, for example, a, a publicly run institution to uh, to cover to improve uh, mobile communications cover and five uh, G area. Uh, in areas of the countries that are more remote and uh, and are not uh, getting that from the private sector. Finally, um, as I already said, uh, digital infrastructure has been a, a high priority for the federal government. It's, it's going to be a key focus for the next one. And um, a problem we've had been having in this regard is also simply that uh, we lacked a few uh, capacities in, in the area of planning and indeed construction. Um, um, that uh, need to be removed in order for additional funds to actually achieve the, the role of in improving and uh, expanding the digital infrastructure. So in my last slide, I'll fin finish up with this, is a bit more abstract on the question of how innovation policies can play uh, a role in the digital and uh, climate neutral transformation uh, as compared to classical industrial policies that, that uh, I think uh, uh, we have had in, in the European Union and Germany. I don't know about uh, so, so well about Korea, but you probably also um, uh, consider industrial policy as an important uh, element of, of public policy. As a, as a small, sorry, as a small um, comparison, if you look at the EU budgets, uh, if you if you look at innovation uh, activities and resources, um, you could, for example, take the the Horizon EU, which is the EU's key funding program for research and innovation, that accounts for about uh, a fifth of the expenditure that the EU is uh, is uh, still spending on on agricultural policy. That is not to put uh, that has historical reasons. And I would won't go much into that and uh, it's not to put the uh, to put any blame on that but it, it shows you that um, if we look at the, the future uh, needs uh, for the digital and, and, and climate neutral transformation it might be important to give innovation uh, policies uh, also a bit bigger role in terms of funding and um, nationally this in Germany has been skewed somewhat to existing technologies, leading sectors, automobile sector is a good example for that. 
and that might indeed hamper our progress uh, when we try to achieve our climate goals and uh, to uh, to f to complete the digital transformation to the extent that some of the technologies needed to 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 achieve these targets might not have been developed yet and so it might be important to shift resources into smart innovation policy to promote new technologies and uh, key few components that have been discussed in the, in the past so a couple of years uh, I have listed here in the end of this slide the uh, the need to focus on entirely new pro project uh, technologies processes and products to complement the policies that are already aimed at transferring the present technologies into the post carbon future that is an important element it is probably also uh, important for us to improve our uh, institutional designs in this regard um, uh, it would be going into much detail uh, uh, to explain you know the the institutional design in Germany between different ministries um, but uh, let's let, let me just say that um, there are uh, problems sometimes to to uh, to transfer the the results from for, for example the the Ministry of Research into other areas where uh, people are working at the forefront of uh, of implementing uh, this into the uh, business sector, for example, at the Ministry of Economics, and there are certainly some some uh, leeway where we can do more uh, if we improve our institutional design in this. One element that's been discussed quite a bit in in, in Germany uh, these uh, these days is the so-called mission-based approach that you could use for that. That's going back to uh, to the uh, Mariana Mazzucato. A uh, UK professor who's been promoting this on the European level for quite some time, which is basically the idea to formulate in your overarching societal goals, for example, as we do in the area of climate uh, change and carbon neutrality, uh, to provide uh, like a focus focal point for the public sector, but also for the for the business sector and for civil society to uh, to achieve certain commonly agreed goals and then to focus all resources in the different areas including the federal government and its ministries to achieve these goals i think the the climate approach and uh, as you heard from from mr best the fit for 55 um, process is one good example of how you could do that and it might be extended to other areas where transformation in, in the upcoming years is imminent and that is uh, relevant both on the national and the european level and with this, I would like to close my presentation. And uh, uh, even though, as I said, um, some of the priorities, and if this conference took place maybe a month from now, I would have been able to give you some more detail on what the, the new government is planning. That is not the case. I still hope it, it uh, offers you some insight of what the current uh, uh, way of thinking is in at the German Ministry of Finance and the German government. And um, we're going to see how it uh, turns out as the new government takes office um, later this year or early next year. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention and uh, again for the invitation to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your informative presentation, Mr. Clark. And yes, in another occasion, we'll wait for your uh, further updates about uh, Germany's financial future. Um, as you all know, we will have uh, the discussion session next, but before that, we'll have to reset the stage. So please allow me to summarize the three presentations uh, earlier. So the first presenter, Ms. Hyungna Oh, delivered a presentation on Korea's New Deal fiscal policy framework. And the fact that Korea's government New Deal uh, budget went up by 29% compared to other areas such as total budget or K New Deal budget, w which was three and f eight respect respectively, show how committed Korea is towards the uh, green future. And the second presenter also uh, shared about the Fit for 55 package that entailed renewable energy, energy efficiency, and climate uh, initiatives. And among the total budget, 
37% will be, again, on New Deal transition and 20% on digital transition. So this also shows how strong of a will Europe has for the green uh, future and pathway. And the third presenter um, from Germany uh, talked about how even though there are accumulated fiscal deficits at this moment due to the GDP effect, which is also known as the denominator effect, the debt to GDP ratio will decrease uh, in the f uh, few coming years. And uh, it seemed that uh, Germany's approach also focused on two major areas, green and digital. But he also mentioned very interesting other elements, such as the Lighthouse Project to take more bold risks, and also R&D projects that are going to be launched in the near future as well. So as we wait for the stage uh, to be set up, let me introduce some of the speakers that are going to be invited. We'll invite Professor Hyung Na Oh, the speaker of the session two, and also Minister Councillor Christopher Bess, and Germany's uh, fiscal policy director, who just spoke now, Mr. Eric Klar, as well as the head of budgeting and public management division of the OECD, Mr. Jon Blondo, and Assistant Secretary Ronnie Downs. Um, he will join us virtually, and President Jong Hun Kim will join us as panelists as well. And the session will be moderated by Hangyang National University President Won He Lee. It seems that the stage is all set. So without further ado, let's invite our moderator, speakers, and discussants to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause. Presently, the floor is yours. We will now begin session two. We have a very interesting session because during the first session, we talked about the survival during COVID-19. In session two, we are talking about how to prepare for the new future. And that is why we hear the words innovation and transition quite a bit during session two. Well, we listened to Deputy Minister Choi's opening remarks, and he mentioned these points already in his opening remarks. Let us now start our discussion. Even if you write the right answers on the test, if you don't write them within the time frame, you always get a zero on your test. We are actually very pressed for time, so we would like to ask each discussant to limit their statement to five minutes each. We will first start with Mr. Jan Blundell. Thank you very much. It is, a, it is a great honor to be here at the OECD, Ministry of Economy and Finance, uh, uh, ninth annual uh, Global Financial Forum. I will say a few more words about that uh, at the end of the symposium. But let me just sort of to uh, start the sort of comments on this. It is very clear from our presentations that we have been living in extraordinary fiscal times. Uh, vast amounts of expenditures have been made. And as Professor Lee highlighted, uh, loans and guarantees have also been a very substantial part of uh, the response in many countries. The decisions were taken exceptionally quickly in many, in many cases. So both vast amounts of money and very quick decision making. And this was, of course, all done in order to support individuals and businesses during the COVID crisis. And I think the most important thing to highlight, which I think uh, our colleague Christophe did here, was to say that this has largely been a success. Uh, that uh, if we think back to some of the discussions at the outset of COVID-19, uh, talking about another great depression, uh, that was sort of a foregone conclusion when you listen to some people. So let's not forget that as well. Uh, and uh, sort of in the interest of time, if I, if I skip through uh, some, of my, some of my remarks here and uh, and then sort of look a little bit more to, towards the future, uh, which, is, uh, which have, we have been discussing in, this, in the second part of the symposium. I see three issues uh, that will, in fiscal terms, tend to dominate our thinking going forward. 
Uh, these are all very highly important issues. None of them are new to you. They all have uh, a huge uh, fiscal aspect to them. And budgeting and public financial management also has uh, a big role to play in, in dealing with them. The three are, not surprisingly, climate change and other environmental issues, where green budgeting will play a key role. The aging of the population, changing demographics, where gender budgeting will pay, play a key role, and I think this is becoming increasingly recognized in OECD countries. And finally, health and social care, uh, which will have a massive impact on, uh, on the public finances going forward, separately from the aging issue. Just a few words on, on green budgeting. Uh, we recently had an OECD ministerial council meeting that was uh, co-chaired or the deputy chair of the meeting was, uh, was Korea. And they concluded by saying that the climate issues facing our countries is an existential threat uh, to countries. That this is clearly the number one issue facing us. Uh, we've had a very good outline uh, in this session about the responses that countries are doing towards uh, carbon-free, uh, green, reducing greenhouse gas uh, emissions. The fiscal consequences of what is being contemplated here are great, both on the expenditure side and also on the revenue side. Uh, we discussed uh, on the expenditure side the, the production, uh, supporting renewable production of energy, also to support various efforts to reduce demand for energy by making it more energy efficient, the buildings, also building the, the various infrastructure for renewable energy. On the tax side, uh, that is uh, also a very, very important picture. Uh, there is a lot of debate about carbon taxation going on, a lot of discussion on it. But from a totally revenue perspective for governments, if a carbon tax, which is being discussed as a revenue source now, is successful, uh, it will over time eliminate itself as a revenue source. Uh, so it is good to bear that in mind. And many of the traditional revenue sources of governments uh, are related to carbon issues. Uh, we see in some countries the revenue going to highway infrastructure funds is declining quite a bit because they are related to gasoline tax revenues, which are going down. And that is just a foretaste of what can happen on a much larger scale. And to fully implement a carbon tax, the mitigation uh, efforts that are needed, because a carbon tax will have very severe impacts on certain groups and a very unequal impact on groups, and the mitigation measures in terms of additional outlays in order to do that will be very, very significant. So the numbers we are talking about here are, are very, very high, and the impact on how governments budget and the revenue sources of budget are the same. On this issue, I would also like to uh, sort of discuss a little bit about how the budget process deals with green issues. Uh, Professor O, uh, she said sort of, you know, this is the traditional budget, this is the green budget. But uh, deciding what is part of the green budget and not part of the normal budget uh, is not a science. And this is hotly debated politically. Uh, we have uh, the experience of the EU taxonomy for, for investment expenditure, what counts as a green, uh, as a green investment. And this will only go, go become more of an issue in the future. What is green, what is not green? Because green is viewed in many ways as a virtuous expenditure or as a virtuous investment. It often uh, faces less scrutiny than traditional expenditures. By no means always, but there is a risk for that. Uh, you have countries issuing green bonds on the assumption that markets will more readily accept green bonds than regular bonds. So the way in, in order to uh, classify various expenditures and investments as green is great. So finding a criteria for what is green and verifying that countries are actually following that criteria will become a key issue. Uh, 
The second is aging and gender budgeting. Uh, this is facing most OECD countries, the aging of the population, severe demographic trends. Korea, I think, is an extreme example of uh, the demographic trends that are facing many of our countries, shrinking labor markets. And here, gender budgeting, which has traditionally been viewed as an aspect of, uh, of social justice, a human rights issues, an equality issue, is now increasingly being seen also as an economics issue. Uh, it is important to recognize what, what uh, gender budgeting is. It is not uh, uh, a his and hers budget and, and focusing on that these two should be equal. It is budget impact analysis. It's an information tool, a performance budgeting tool that tells you how various aspects of the budget, it is more commonly applied on the expenditure side, affect different groups. Not just sort of the initial outlay uh, of the budget in terms of uh, what is in the budget, but the impact it has. So if I take an example of uh, a construction project, the immediate out gender outlay would be, for example, the, the amount of construction workers on the project, which in most cases would tend to be more male-oriented than female. But the second order of fact is who is that construction intended for? Who are the users for this project? And if they tend to be more female than male, then it throws it in an entirely different light. And the third order effect, which is the economic impact or the social impact. And if this expenditure is in such a way that it promotes the labor force participation of women, it can have an incredibly important long-term economic consequences for the countries. If gender budgeting is used as a vehicle to promote the participation of women in the labor market to counter some of the pressures of aging populations. And lastly, which I will just sort of highlight the issues because there are no neat budgetary uh, fixes for this, is health and social care. Uh, I highlighted earlier, this is not really a demographic issue. This is not related to aging because that is not the main driver of health and social care expenditure. Uh, the drivers are, as countries become richer, the expectations of citizens for health care grow very much. Uh, there are incredible technological advances when it comes to medical care. And as countries grow richer and higher expectations, there is a demand from citizens for governments to fund these expenditures. Uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, there are more and more incredibly expensive pharmaceuticals coming on the market. And this will all have to be dealt with through budgetary means. And these are very difficult decisions that are coming up. And we also need to link this with uh, social care. Because in many of our countries, hospitals are increasingly being occupied by people who do not need to be in hospitals. Uh, that they are people who are sufficient who, who are, do not need medical care, but cannot live alone unassisted. So there's a great need for social care issues, but here this is in, in many cases also a governance structure because social care may be the responsibility of a different level of government than, than health care. So this is a very, very complex issue. There are no easy answers here, uh, so which I thought it would be appropriate to leave on that note but I highlight these three issues as, as the means forward. Thank you very much, and I apologize for going over. Thank you very much. When we think about government inefficiencies and why there's a lack of trust for the government, well, there are books written about this, but in this extraordinary era, I think the governments have responded very quickly to earn the confidence of our citizens. So not only should we think about just expenditures, but we have to think about green budgets. For example, carbon taxes. Maybe we can think about gender budget and green budget as well. And in terms of social care, we also need to take a look at various care that should be provided by the government. Please. Let's go on to Mr. Rooney Downs.
Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, President Lee, for those uh, remarks. I must say I found these, uh, this series of presentations and discussions to be quite uh, thought-provoking. Uh, just on the point that President Lee mentioned about uh, trust and confidence among our citizens, uh, I think, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, I think the response of governments to the COVID crisis has uh, hopefully helped to support those levels of trust that the government, uh, that governments are uh, doing their best uh, for our citizens. But I think the, um, the green crisis, the climate crisis that the world is facing is the next area where we need to show uh, as policymakers and as governments that uh, we can, uh, that we are worthy of that trust and that we will act uh, to do what needs to be done. And um, in the interests of time, um, President, I will, I will just focus on the the, the green dimension. Uh, there's plenty of issues I could pick up on from the earlier speakers, but uh, uh, how the budgets can be used to promote uh, climate transition, I think, is a key challenge for this and for the next generation of budget policy makers, fiscal policy makers. So uh, I'll, I'll, make, I'll focus my remarks on that area. And uh, I was very happy uh, with uh, Professor O's presentation, which did outline the landscape uh, here that we're working in quite comprehensively. And uh, I, I think there are three points in particular uh, that I would emphasize when it comes to uh, budgeting for climate action. Uh, one is, first point is, I think we need to be aware that uh, there is a broad ecosystem of, uh, of policies and measures and instruments that are springing up in different areas of policy, but that they need to be uh, interconnected. They need to be used uh, as a whole. Uh, and, and we as policymakers need to be aware of what's going on in different areas and help different parts interconnect. And I'll expand on that a little bit. Um, the second point is there's an urgency to taking action in the near term, in the immediate term, um, and that's linked to the third point, which is the opportunity. Uh, taking, action in the, uh, uh, taking action to promote the climate transition um, will be challenging to, to our pre-existing uh, pre issues and expectations in society, which is of subsidies is, is a sensitive one, for example. But there are also huge opportunities, and there are opportunities for first movers for early movers in this space, which is why I, I link it to the, the question of, of urgency. Um, just to pick up a few points in turn, which are, are related to these three themes. Uh, on the question of, uh, of carbon taxation, um, this is an area where Ireland has uh, some experience. Uh, we, we do have a government uh, in Ireland at present, which is very motivated to deal with the uh, with the, the climate crisis. And uh, last year, the government introduced, uh, did move to introduce carbon taxation, uh, multi-year carbon taxation, uh, so that the level of tax on fossil fuels goes up a relatively small amount, but it goes up a relatively small amount every year for the next 20 years. And set out in legislation last year, so it happens automatically. There does not need to be an annual discussion or an annual argument about it. And that is sending a signal, a long-term signal that will affect behaviours. Um, so this year, for example, in this in the budget that we had recently, despite the fact that you know there's a lot of volatility, as we know, on, uh, on oil markets and fossil fuel markets, um, a lot of pressure on prices, despite this pressure, the carbon tax went ahead. There was very little discussion or question about you know, pausing or reversing carbon tax, so that, that increase went ahead. Um, and then with that long-term commitment to carbon tax, that links back as well to the earlier point I made about uh, long-term capital investment. Uh, so uh, at least you know, for, for the next 10 or 15 years, we've taken some of that money, uh, that carbon tax revenue, and we've uh, allocated it towards a number of very specific objectives. So that money is effectively being um, hypothecated or earmarked 
uh, for, for particular goals is the goal of uh, climate justice. Uh, so, uh, you know, the carbon tax money is being used directly to help uh, those portions of the population that are most affected by, by, the, by, by fuel poverty, for example. Secondary is the uh, capital investment in areas like the retrofitting, the refurbishment of uh, buildings to make them more environmentally friendly, investment in public transport, so away from roads towards uh, public transport into the future. Um, uh, and the, linked to the opportunity element there as well, the government has been heavily promoting the message that investment in retrofitting and building new homes, which are more environmentally safe and sound, uh, that this is uh, part of the, the employment framework of tomorrow. So these are the jobs of tomorrow, the future facing jobs, uh, which uh, where if we build up an expertise, a national expertise in these areas, uh, we can expect uh, we can expect to get some rewards uh, into the future. And um, just finally, uh, you know, a, a couple of points about green budgeting and uh, or uh, green. Uh, I think it was called climate PFM, climate public financial management. In Professor O's uh, outline, this is an area that's getting a lot of attention uh, in Ireland and uh, around the world. I know at um, COP twenty six uh, next week. Um, there will be a round table on green budgeting that uh, Ireland is chairing. It's, it's, a, it's an OECD, IMF, European Commission uh, event that's um, op open to all. But that will be discussing the principles that should inform uh, green budgeting and green PFM uh, into the future. And linked to that, then, uh, you know, on the private side, there's a growing focus upon climate finance. So there are funds out there that are looking for uh, an investment home and when we can demonstrate that we have a rigorous approach to identifying, you know, tagging uh, those areas of expenditure and investment that are green, uh, then we can um, we can uh, marry those to make those parts of the ecosystem uh, work together. Uh, couple, final couple of brief points I'll make. Um, Professor Rowe talked about uh, carbon budgeting in Ireland, and I think in some other countries when we talk about carbon budgeting, we mean something quite specific. It's just been introduced, it's just been launched in Ireland. Uh, carbon budgeting in the sense, not the fiscal sense, but making clear to each sector in society what their level of emissions, what their level of carbon emissions is, their, their level of permissible, allowable carbon emissions is uh, into the future. And then uh, putting pressure, um, putting a requirement on each of these sectors, whether it be industry or agriculture uh, or energy, putting a, a, or transport, putting a responsibility on each of these sectors to bring their carbon levels, level carbon emission levels down within those budgets. So the concept of a budget that we all know and love in the fiscal sense is being extended to uh, carbon as a currency, so to speak, uh, that everybody must, uh, must live within uh, their limits. Final point though, it is an important point about the challenges that we've heard uh, identified. Um, yeah, there are challenges of inflation, there are challenges of capacity. You know, we all have, in, in our respective countries, we all have different priorities and different demands for our resources. And in Ireland at the moment, there's a lot of attention, been a lot of attention to housing, making sure we have enough houses, uh, housing for our, our young people, for the next generations. And there's a lot of uh, uh, shortages there. So we need to have, we need to build more houses, but at the same time, we need more workers, we need builders to work on retrofitting the existing stock, we need people to work in construction to deliver all this uh, infrastructure that I mentioned earlier. So making all of these things work together is going to be a big challenge for us. But I think the most important thing is that we do have a map, we have a roadmap set out for where we as countries want to get to in the future. And uh, then we can try to make it work. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ireland is a small and open. Yes, thank you very much. Ireland is a small and open country, and you said that Ireland was believed to be vulnerable for in terms of crisis. But I think that at the same time, you have uh, leeway to carry out various experiments, and also I think that you can ensure equality among the generations with your attempts and efforts. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Kim. Uh, 
let me uh, talk about about four areas of fiscal policy in terms of rethinking the role of fiscal policy. Uh, the first issue is um, how to manage uh, growing government debt. Um, although uh, the, the government debt in Korea is relatively much lower than many other major uh, OECD countries, it is now uh, growing uh, significantly if, uh, in terms of Korean history. So uh, the immediate response to this uh, aspect is to, is to think about how to uh, at least uh, flatten the growing pattern of government debt. But on the other hand, uh, the international organizations such as uh, IMF and uh, many other public finance experts emphasize the uh, ever lowering uh, long-term uh, government interest rate and low uh, interest burden uh, compared to GDP. So you have, uh, if you just look at the index of government debt to, as a ratio to GDP, it is increasing. But if you look at the interest uh, burden uh, to GDP, it is still declining. So the general recommendation is that you don't have to hurry to really reduce the government debt level. But on the other hand, in the case of Korea, it's not now, but in 20 years or 30 years, because of the age-related uh, costs, uh, pension and health care, those are really steadily and, and, and continuously uh, increasing area. So therefore, we have this uh, challenge of balancing between the, the government debt in the general account and uh, the ever uh, increasing uh, debt burden in the uh, social uh, security area. So really it requires, I think after this COVID-19, uh, uh, how to balance these two, two issues and, and, and requires, I think, uh, really strategic thinking about how to manage it in, in medium term and long term. And, and uh, second issue is uh, strengthening social uh, protection uh, for the, uh, the, the vulnerable. Um, the COVID-19 has let us know that uh, there are certain uh, uh, group of people who are much more vulnerable uh, to COVID-19 uh, for example, small uh, business owners and uh, irregular workers, part-time workers, compared to those who are, who are working in, in big governments, uh, big uh, companies, and, 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 and who are working in government, for example. And uh, uh, that kind of forces us to think of, rethink the, the, the design of social uh, security systems, which is based upon uh, wage-related uh, social uh, security contributions, health care, uh, pension, and uh, unemployment uh, insurance, all those are available only to those who have regular jobs. But uh, during this COVID-19 crisis, we certainly extended our help to the irregular workers. And, and, and this experience, I think, we'll have to think about how to extend the social security net overall to, to strengthen the, the uh, protection uh, role of, of the government. The, the third issue that we are facing after this COVID-19 is a um, well-known issue of growing income and wealth disparities. And uh, this took place in, in two ways. The first uh, definitely hit harder uh, on the vulnerable uh, people, but also uh, more importantly, this uh, quantitative easing that has, has been going on uh, since early uh, uh, 2020 uh, really significantly in increased the, the asset value, including housing. So in, in, in case of Korea now, the, the highly increased housing prices causing not only um, economic uh, issues, but also political uh, kind of issues as well. And um, 
it, it is an issue that, that you know, does not have a, a simple question, but really, uh, I think uh, what is happening uh, in, 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 in not just in Korea, but also in, in many other OECD countries, when crisis uh, takes place, there is a combination of fiscal policy and monetary policy, and the impact of quantitative easing it, it should be uh, taken into consider, uh, consideration uh, when we design fiscal policy. I even thought about uh, thinking of a t kind of temporary imposing, uh, in the case of Korea, kind of Tobin tax-like uh, transaction tax on, on speculative housing uh, uh, investment. Some, you know, it was uh, uh, reported in the news that some uh, certain people uh, have like 10 or 20 houses uh, during this period. So um, this is something that uh, we also have to think about the implication of economic crisis because the economic crisis requires not only fiscal policy but also very easy uh, monetary policy. And, and finally, um, the challenges of digital revolution and, and green growth, um, I'll just briefly remark, because it has been uh, uh, addressed uh, by Yon and, and uh, uh, Loni, um, whether in the long run uh, this green budget will, will be, uh, you know, in a sense neutral uh, uh, in terms of the go uh, budget impact on the government, uh, uh, Professor O already mentioned in her presentation, but uh, Ronnie uh, actually, I think, agree with uh, Ronnie when he said that uh, this is really an uh, requires the design of uh, environmental tax that is earmarked for certain purposes. Uh, about 20 years ago, I think it was really, really a popular uh, topic whether to earmark the environmental tax revenue or not. And, and according to my, my uh, 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 memory, uh, because uh, Yon also mentioned about that, the impact of the environmental tax and, and carbon tax is not even, and, and it really creates some vulnerable class. So, so by earmarking the revenue to those, to, for the purpose of helping them, will be acceptable politically by the general public. So I, I do agree with, First of all, we also have to think about the revenue side and also have to think about how to use that revenue. And, and finally, all these considerations uh, imply that we're going to have a bigger government role, bigger role of fiscal policy, bigger role of, therefore, central budget authority. Now, however, at least in the case of Korea, Central Budget Authority is facing, um, you know, the, 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 the issue of balancing the, the political consideration and just the pure neutral fiscal policy design. And how to take a, this balance is, uh, is, is going to be uh, much more important because we are now having, going to have much bigger uh, government, uh, bigger fiscal role. And uh, I cannot just assume, uh, there, there can be many, many issues that are related to this, but because this is the uh, forum uh, hosted by both uh, uh, Korean uh, government and the, the SBO uh, in OECD, um, to make uh, fiscal policy in Korea um, kind of as efficiently as possible, as neutral as possible, I think it's important to, to, to um, kind of let people know uh, the international standard, in a sense, and the, the knowledge we get from the OECD has been always important uh, and helpful for the past 20 years in, 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 in neutralizing some debates uh, on some issue because all debates are influenced by uh, political considerations. And, and this has been, in a sense, countered by the, the international uh, standard and the knowledge we get from the activities of OECD, and especially for this case, the, the activities in the SBO, 
has been uh, always helpful, and I think it will be even great, uh, more important in the future. So, uh, on that note, uh, let me finish my remark. Yeah. Uh, so. Thank you very much. During session two, we have been able to take a look at the relationship between the government and the market. We were able to hear the Germans case, and it was mentioned uh, that a lighthouse project is implemented. And we were able to talk about the role of green budget and green policies. Uh, I would like to give you more time, but because of the time constraint, we cannot carry on this discussion anymore. But we do have our contact info, so I do hope that we can continue to keep in touch. Now, amidst the pandemic, we have implemented various policies, but I do believe that through this process, we have been able to look back at our lives and we our economy. And I think that it probably was a time for uh, promoting innovation in our society. So thank you very much. Indeed, a very constructive uh, discussion. And I would like to uh, convey my special thanks to moderator President Lee for your excellent time management as well. So we have finished all of the sessions that were prepared today. And finally, we're going to have uh, closing remarks by our renowned guest. And the closing remarks will be delivered by head of the Budgeting and Public Management Division of the OECD, Mr. Jan Blondel, who organized today's uh, forum. So ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to invite him to the stage and let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, the, the last thing that you will hear at this, uh, at this forum, so I will be brief. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, participating in the ninth annual uh, Global Fiscal Forum. This is organized uh, jointly by the Ministry of Economy and Finance and the OECD and uh, has been now for, for nine years. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, colleagues from uh, the Korea Development Institute, the KDI, now as a partner in organizing this. Uh, this is the 25th year since Korea joined the OECD. In fact, it was this week uh, in October, 25 years ago. And uh, if I reflect on that time, uh, we have had a person from the Ministry of Economy and Finance with us in Paris almost since day one. I think it was the first ministry, or among the very first ministries that sent a second D from from Seoul to Paris. And we have been fortunate during all of this time to have uh, a person from Korea with us to give us uh, the voice of Korea uh, sort of in our, daily, in our daily workings as we're designing our work program. So we have benefited greatly from that. Uh, and overall, Korea's willingness to, uh, to share their experiences with others in forums such as this is uh, the, the value that Korea is providing sort of to the world uh, in its openness to share its experiences, its development story is truly appreciated by, by everyone. And at the same time, it is also such a pleasure to be in Korea, a country that is so welcome to hearing the experiences from other countries, uh, how they can be adapted and adopted in Korea. So it is a wonderful partner to have. Uh, and there have also, of course, been a lot of friendships that have been formed among individuals at the OECD around uh, the OECD community and officials here from Korea, which may be the most important thing. Uh, let me also briefly thank uh, the other people that were here from the United States, uh, Andrew, Eric from Germany, Ronnie from Ireland, Christoph from uh, the European Union, uh, all of our colleagues from uh, Korea and the, and the OECD, uh, Jung Hoon, I don't know how to classify you because we, we claim you as, as one of the OECD, but uh, you are, of course, also from, uh, from Korea. And uh, it is just, uh, as a final thought, absolutely wonderful to be meeting in person again. This is uh, one of the first meetings that I participate, again, that is not virtual, that is in person. So thank you, Korea, for leading the way again with us in this area. I wish you all a wonderful weekend, and uh, thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Oblondo, once again for your closing remarks. You made me feel very proud to be a Korean. Thank you very much. So this brings us to the very conclusion of today's forum. It is unfortunate that we will not be able to meet everyone in person, even though many of you are joining us online. However, I believe that today's global forum was a very useful and insightful occasion for all of you. So once again, I would like to express my gratitude on behalf of the host and organizers of this event, and thank you very much for staying with us until the very end. This has been Claudia Lee, your MC for the ninth Global Fiscal Forum. Thank you.